After that, it all happened very quickly. She would learn that with Sean Courtney, this was always the way. She remained only five more days at the monastery, but in that time the German breakthrough at Mortom was contained by dour, bloody fighting. And once the line was stabilised and reinforced, Sean Courtney had a few hours each day to spare for her. They dined together every evening, and he answered her endless questions about Africa and its people and animals, about the Courtney family and its members, with good-natured patience. Mostly they spoke English, but when at a loss for a word, Santan lapsed into Flemish again. Then at the end of the meal she would prepare his cigar and light it for him, pour his cognac, and then perch beside him, talking still, until Anna came to fetch her, or Sean was summoned to the operations room. Then she would come to him, and hold up her face for his kiss with such a childlike innocence that Sean found himself dreading the approaching hour of her departure. John Pierce brought their nursing uniforms to Santan and Anna. The white veils and the white cross straps of the apron were worn over a blue-grey dress, and Santan and Anna made the finer adjustments themselves, their needles giving a touch of French flair to the baggy, shapeless outfits. Then it was time to leave, and Sangane loaded their meagre baggage into the rolls, and Sean Courtney came down the cloisters, gruff and stern with the pain of leave-taking. "'Look after her,' he ordered Anna, and Anna glowered at him in righteous indignation at this gratuitous advice. "'I will be at the docks to meet you when you come home,' Santan promised him, and Sean scowled with embarrassment and pleasure when she went up on tiptoe to kiss him in front of his staff. He watched the rolls pull away with a girl waving at him through the back window, then roused himself and rounded on his staff. "'Well, gentlemen, what are we all gawking at? We're fighting a war here, not conducting a bloody Sunday school picnic.' And he stopped back down the cloisters, angry at himself, already feeling the girl's absence so painfully. The Protea Castle had been a mail ship of the Union Castle Line. She was a fast, three-funneled passenger liner which had operated on the Cape Town to Southampton run before being converted to a hospital ship and repainted pristine white with scarlet crosses on her sides and funnels. She lay at the dock of the inner harbour of Calais, taking on her passengers for the southward voyage, and they were a far cry from the elegant, affluent travellers who had filled her pre-war lists. Five railway coaches had been shunted onto the rail spur of the wharf, and from these the pathetic stream of humanity crossed to the liner and went up her fore and aft gangways. These were the veritable sweepings of the battlefield. They had been rejected by the medical board as so incapacitated that they could not even be patched up sufficiently to feed the man-hungry Baal of the British Expeditionary Force. There would be twelve hundred on board for the southbound voyage, and on the return northbound leg the Protea Castle would be repainted in the camouflage of an ordinary troop ship and bring another load of young, eager and healthy young men for a sojourn in the hell of the trenches of northern France. Santan stood beside the rolls at the wharfside and stared with dismay at this ruined legion as they went aboard. There were the amputees, missing an arm or a leg, the lucky ones with a severance below knee or elbow. They swung across the wharf on their crutches or with an empty sleeve of their tunic pinned up neatly. Then there were the blind, led by their companions, and the spinal cases carted aboard on their stretchers, and the gas victims with the mucous membranes of their noses and throats burned away by the chlorine gas, and the shell-shocked who twitched and jerked and rolled their eyes uncontrollably, and the burn victims with monstrous pink shiny scar tissue that had contracted to trap their limbs into the bent position, or drawn down their ravaged heads onto their chests, so that they were as twisted and contorted as hunchbacks. "'You can give us a hand, ye love,' one of the orderlies had spotted her uniform, and Sontan roused herself. She turned quickly to the Zulu driver, I will find your father in Bajani. Mbajani. Sangane grinned happily that she had the name right. 
and I will give him your message. Go in peace, little lady. Santan clasped his hand and snatched a carpet bag from him, and followed by Anna, hurried to her new duties. The loading went on through the night, and only when it was completed a little before dawn were they free to try and find the quarters that they had been allocated. The senior medical officer was a grim-faced major, and it was apparent that word had been whispered to him from on high. "'Where have you been?' he demanded when Santan reported to his cabin. "'I have been expecting you since noon yesterday. We sail in two hours.' "'I have been here since noon, down on sea deck, helping Dr. Solomon. "'You should have reported to me,' he told her coldly. "'You can't just wander around the ship suiting yourself. "'I am responsible to General—' "'He cut himself off, and went off on a new tack. "'Besides, sea deck is other ranks. "'Pardon?' "'Through practice, Santan's English had improved immeasurably, "'but many terms still eluded her. "'Other ranks! not officers. From now on you will be working with officers only. The lower decks are out of bounds to you. Out of bounds, he repeated slowly, as though speaking to a backward child. Am I making myself clear to you? Santan was tired, and not used to this type of treatment. Those men down there hurt just as much as the officers do. She told him furiously, they breathe and die just like officers do. The Major blinked and sat back in his chair. He had a daughter the same age as this French chippy, but she would never have dared answer him like that. I can see, young lady, that you are going to be a handful, he said ominously. I did not like the idea of having you ladies on board. I knew it would lead to trouble. Now you listen to me. You are going to be quartered in the cabin right across from mine, he pointed through the open door. You will report to Dr. Stewart and work to his orders. You will eat in the officers' mess, and the lower decks are out of bounds to you. I expect you to conduct yourself with the utmost propriety at all times, and you can be certain that I will be keeping a very sharp eye on you. After such a bleak introduction— the quarters that she and Anna had been allocated came as a delightful surprise, and again she suspected that the hand of General Sean Courtney had moved. They had a suite that would have cost two hundred guineas before the war, twin beds rather than bunks, a small drawing-room with sofa and armchairs and writing-desk, and their own shower and toilet, all tastefully furnished in autumn shades. Santan bounced on the bed and then fell back on the pillows and sighed blissfully. Anna, I'm too tired to undress. It's your night dress, Anna ordered, and don't forget to clean your teeth. They were awakened by the alarm gongs ringing, the blast of whistles in the companionway, and a hammering on the cabin door. The ship was under way, vibrating to her engines and working to the send of the sea. After the first moments of panic, they learned from their cabin steward that it was a boat drill. Dressing and strapping themselves hastily into their bulky life-jackets, they trooped onto the upper deck and found their lifeboat station. The ship had just cleared the harbour breakwater and was standing out into the channel. It was a grey, misty morning, and the wind whipped about their ears so that there was a general murmur of relief when the stand-down was sounded and breakfast was served in the first-class dining-room, which had been converted into the officers' mess for the walking wounded. Santan's entrance caused a genteel pandemonium. Very few of the officers had realised that there was a pretty girl on board, and they found it difficult to conceal their delight. There was a great deal of jockeying for position, but very quickly the first officer, taking advantage of the fact that the captain was still on the bridge, exercised his rank, and Santan found herself installed at his right hand, surrounded by a dozen attentive and solicitous gentlemen, with Anna seated opposite, glowering like a guardian bulldog. The ship's officers were all British, but the patients were colonials, for the Protea castle was going on eastwards after rounding the Cape of Good Hope. Seated around Santan, there was a captain of Australian light horse who had lost a hand, 
a pair of New Zealanders, one with a piratical black patch over his missing eye, and the other with an equally piratical long John Silver wooden stump, a young Rhodesian named Jonathan Ballantyne, who had won an M.C. at the Somme, but paid for it with a burst of machine-gun fire through the belly, and other eager young men who had lost all parts of their anatomy. They plied her with food from the buffet. No, no, I cannot eat your great English breakfast. You will make me fat and ugly like a pig. And she glowed at their concerted denials. The war had been in progress since Sun Ten was a mere fourteen years old, and with all the young men gone, she had never known the pleasure of being surrounded by a horde of admirers. She saw the senior medical officer scowling at her from the captain's table, and as much to spite him as for her own amusement, she set herself out to be pleasant to the young men surrounding her, although she felt a stirring of guilt that she might be less than faithful to Michael's memory. She consoled herself. It is my duty. They are my patients. A nurse must be good to her patients. And she smiled and laughed with them. And they were pathetically eager to catch her attention, render small services for her, and answer her questions. Why are we not going in convoy? she asked. Is it not dangerous to go down Chanel en plein soleil in broad daylight? I have heard about the Rewa. The Rewa was the British hospital ship with three hundred wounded on board that had been torpedoed by a German U boat in the Bristol Channel on January 4th that year. Fortunately, the ship had been abandoned with the loss of only three lives but it had fueled the anti-German propaganda, displayed in most public places with the posters headed What a Red Rag is to a Bull, the Red Cross is to the Hun, with a graphic account of the atrocity beneath. Santan's questions precipitated a lively argument at the breakfast table. The Rewa was torpedoed at night, Jonathan Ballantyne pointed out reasonably. The U-boat commander probably didn't see the Red Crosses, Oh, come now, those U-boat chaps are absolute butchers. I don't agree. They're just ordinary fellows like you and me. The captain of the ship obviously believes that too. That's why we are covering the most dangerous down-channel leg in daylight to let the U-boats get a good look at our Red Cross markings. I think they'll leave us alone, once they know what we are. Nonsense, damned Huns would torpedo their own mothers-in-law. So would I, mind you. The ship is steaming at twenty-two knots, the first officer reassured Santan. The U-boat is capable of only seven knots when submerged. It would have to be lying directly in our track to have any chance of a shot at us. Odds of a million to one, miss. You don't have to worry at all. Just enjoy the voyage. A tall, round-shouldered young doctor with a mild scholarly air and steel room spectacles stood before Santan as she rose from the breakfast table. I am Dr. Archibald Stewart, Nurse de Terry, and Major Wright has put you in my charge. Santen liked the new forms of address. Nurse de Terry had a nice professional ring to it. She was not so certain that she enjoyed being in anyone's charge, however. Do you have any medical or nursing training? Dr. Stewart went on. And Santen's initial liking for him cooled. He had exposed her in the first few seconds and in front of her new-found admirers. She shook her head, trying not to make the confession public. But he went on, remorselessly. I thought not. He eyed her dubiously, and then seemed to become aware of her embarrassment. Never mind. A nurse's most important duty is to cheer up her patients. From what little I've seen, you are very good at that. I think we'll make you chief cheer-upper, but only on a deck. Strict orders from Major Wright. A deck only. Dr. Archibald Stewart's appointment turned out to be inspired. From an early age, Santan's organizational skills had been honed in the running of the Chateau of Mont Homme, where she had been her father's hostess and assistant housekeeper. Effortlessly, she manipulated the band of young men that had gathered about her into an entertainment's team. The Protea Castle had a library of many thousands of volumes, and she quickly instituted a distribution and collection scheme for the bedridden cases. 
and a roster of readers for the blind and illiterate amongst the men on the lower decks. She arranged smoking concerts and deck games and card tournaments. The Comte had been a wicked bridge player and taught her his skills. Her team of one-eyed, one-legged, maimed assistant alleviators of the boredom of the long voyage vied with each other to win her approval and render their services, and the patients in the tiers of bunks thought up a dozen tricks to delay her beside them when she made her unofficial rounds each morning. Amongst the patients was a captain of the National Mounted Rifles, who had been in the convoy of ambulances during the retreat from Morton, and he greeted her ecstatically the first time she entered his ward with her armful of books. Sunshine! It's Sunshine herself! And the nickname followed her about the ship. Nurse Sunshine! When the usually surly Chief Medical Officer Major Wright used the nickname for the first time, Santen's adoption by the ship's company was unanimous. In the circumstances, there was little time for mourning, but every night just before composing herself for sleep, Santan lay in the darkness and conjured up Michael's image on her mind's eye, and then clasped both hands over her lower stomach. Our son, Michel. Our son. The brooding skies and brutal black seas of the Bay of Biscay were left behind on the long white wake, and head of the bows the flying fish spun like silver coins across the blue velvet surface of the ocean. At latitude thirty degrees north, the debonair young Captain Jonathan Ballantyne, who was the reputed heir to the one hundred thousand acre cattle ranches of his father Sir Ralph Ballantyne, Prime Minister of Rhodesia, proposed marriage to Santan. I can hear poor papa, Santan mimicked the comte so accurately that it cast a shadow in Anna's eyes. One hundred thousand acres, you crazy wicked child. Tiens, alors, how can you refuse one hundred thousand acres? And after that, the marriage proposals became an epidemic. Even Dr. Archibald Stewart, her immediate superior, blinking through his steel-room spectacles and sweating nervously, stammered through a carefully rehearsed speech and looked more gratified than abashed when Santan kissed both his cheeks in polite refusal. At the equator, Santan prevailed on Major Wright to don the regalia of King Neptune, and the crossing ceremony was conducted amidst wild hilarity and widespread inebriation. Santan herself turned out to be the main attraction, clad in a mermaid costume of her own design. Anna had protested strenuously at the décolleté, all the while she helped to sew it, but the ship's company adored it. They whistled and clapped and stamped, and there was another rash of proposals immediately after the crossing. Anna huffed and gruffed, but secretly was well content with the change she saw coming over her charge. Before her eyes, Santan was making that wonderful transformation from girl to young womanhood. Physically, she was beginning to bloom with early pregnancy. Her fine skin took on a luster like mother of pearl. She lost the last vestiges of adolescent gawkiness as her body filled without losing any of its grace. However more powerful were the other changes the growing confidence and poise, the awareness of her own powers and gifts that she was only now beginning to exercise fully. Anna had known that Santan was a natural mimic, could switch from the midi accent of Jacques the groom to the walloon of the chambermaids and then to the Parisian intellectual of her music teacher. But now she realised that the child had a talent for languages which had never been tested. Santan was already speaking such fluent English that she could differentiate between the Australian and South African and pure Oxford English accents and take them off with startling accuracy. When she greeted her Aussies with a dinky G'day, they hooted with delight. Anna had known also that Santan had a way with figures and money. She had taken over the family accounts when the estate factor had fled to Paris in the first months of the war, and Anna had marvelled at her ability to cast a long column of figures simply by running her pen down it, without the laborious carrying over of digits, and without moving her lips, all of which Anna considered miraculous. Now Santan demonstrated the same acumen. She partnered Major Wright at the bridge table, and they made a formidable pair, 
and her share of the winnings flabbergasted Anna, who did not really approve of gambling. Santan reinvested these. She organised a syndicate with Jonathan Ballantyne and Dr. Stevens, and they were big punters on the daily auction and sweepstake on the ship's run. By the time they crossed the equator, Santan had added nearly two hundred sovereigns to the hoard of Louis de Or they had salvaged from the chateau. Anna had always known that Santan read too much. It will damage your eyes, she had warned her often enough, but she had never realized the depth of the knowledge that Santan had gathered from her books, not until she heard it demonstrated in conversation and discussion. She held her own even against such formidable debaters as Dr. Archibald Stewart, and yet Anna noticed that she was cunning enough not to antagonize her audience by ostentatiously flaunting her learning, and would usually end an argument on a conciliatory note that allowed her male victim to retreat with only slightly ruffled dignity. Yes, Anna nodded comfortably to herself as she watched the girl blooming and opening like some lovely flower in the tropical sunshine. She's a clever one, just like her mamma. It seemed that Santan really had a physical need for warmth and sunlight. She would turn her face up to the sun every time she went on deck. Oh, Anna, I did sweat the cold and the rain. Doesn't this feel wonderful? You are turning ugly brown, Anna warned her. It's so unladylike. And Santan considered her own limbs thoughtfully. Not brown, Anna. Gold. Santan had read so much and queried so many people that she seemed already to know the southern hemisphere into which their ship now thrust its bows. Santan would awake Anna and take her onto the upper deck to act as chaperone while the officer of the watch showed her the southern stars. And, despite the late hour, Anna was dazzled by the splendours of this sky that each evening revealed more of itself before their upturned eyes. Look, Anna, there is Archena at last. It was Michael's own special star. We should all have a special star, he said, and he chose mine for me. Which is it? Anna asked. Which is your star? Ecrax, there, the brightest star in the great cross. There is nothing between it and Michael's star except the pivot of the whole world. The celestial South Pole, he said, between us we would hold the axis of the earth. Wasn't that romantic, Anna? Romantic twaddle, Anna sniffed, and secretly regretted that she had never had a man to say such things to her. Then Anna came to recognize in her charge a talent that seemed to make all the others paled. It was the ability of making men listen to her. It was quite extraordinary to see men like Major Wright and the Protea Castle's captain actually keep silent and attend without that infuriatingly indulgent masculine smirk when Santan spoke seriously. She's only a child, Anna marvelled, yet they treat her like a woman, no, no, more than that even. They are beginning to treat her like an equal. That was truly astonishing. Here were these men... According to a young girl, the respect that thousands of other women, Emmeline Pankhurst and Annie Kenny at their head, had been burning property, throwing themselves under racehorses, hunger-striking and enduring prison sentences to obtain, so far unsuccessfully. Santen made the men listen to her, and very often she made them do what she wanted. Although she was not above using the sly sexual tricks to which women over the ages have been forced to resort. Santem achieved her ends by adding logic, cogent argument, and force of character. These, combined with an appealing smile and level look from dark, fathomless eyes, seemed irresistible. For instance, it took her a mere five days to get Major Wright to rescind his order confining her to ADAC. Although Santan's days were filled to the last minute, she never for a moment lost sight of the ultimate destination. Each day her longing for first sight of the land where Michael had been born and where his son would be born became stronger. 
However busy she was, she never missed the noon shot, and a few minutes before the hour she would race up the companionway to the bridge and arrive in a swirl of her uniform skirts, gabbling breathlessly. Permission to enter the bridge, sir? And the officer of the watch, who had been waiting for her, would salute. Permission granted. You are only just in time, sunshine. Then she would watch, fascinated, as the navigating officers stood on the wing of the bridge with their sextants raised and made the noonday shot of the sun, and then worked out the day's run and the ship's position and marked it on the chart. There you are, sunshine, seventeen degrees, twenty-three minutes south, one hundred and sixty nautical miles northwest of the mouth of the Cunani River, Cape Town in four days' time, God and the weather permitting. Santan studied the map eagerly. So we are already off the South African coast? No, no, that is German West Africa. It was one of the Kaiser's colonies until the South Africans captured it two years ago. What is it like? Jungles? Savannas? No such luck, sunshine. It's one of the most godforsaken deserts in the entire world. And Santan left the chart room and went out onto the wing of the bridge again and stared into the east towards the great continent that still lay far below her watery horizon. Oh, I can barely wait to see it at last. This horse was an animal of the desert. Its distant ancestors had carried kings and Bedouin chieftains over the burning wastes of Arabia. Its bloodlines had been taken north by the Crusaders to the colder climes of Europe, and then hundreds of years later they had been brought out to Africa, again by the colonial expedition of Germany, and landed at the point of Luderitzbucht with the cavalry squadrons of Bismarck. In Africa these horses had been crossed and recrossed with the shaggy, hardy mounts of the Boers and the desert-forged animals of the Hottentots, until this animal emerged a creature well suited to this rugged environment and to the tasks to which it was committed. It had the wide nostrils and fine head of its Arabian type, broad spatulate hooves to cover the soft desert earth, great lungs in its barrel chest, pale chestnut coloration to repel the worst of the sun's rays, a shaggy coat to insulate it from both the burning noon heat and the crackling cold of the desert nights, and the legs and heart to carry its rider to far, milky horizons and beyond. The man upon his back was also of mixed bloodlines, and, like his mount, a creature of the desert and the boundless land. His mother had come out from Berlin when her father had been appointed second-in-command of the military forces in German West Africa. She had met, and despite her family's opposition, married a young Boer from a family rich only in land and spirit. Lothar was the only child of that union, and at his mother's insistence had been sent back to Germany to complete his schooling. He had proved a good scholar, but the outbreak of the Boer War had interrupted his studies. The first his mother had known of his decision to join the Boer forces was when he arrived back in Windhoek and announced, Hers was a warrior family, so her pride was fierce when Lothar had ridden away with the Hottentot servants and three spare horses to seek his father was already in the field against the English. Lothar had found his father at Machersfontein, with his uncle Kurs de la Rey, the legendary Boer commander, and had undergone his initiation to battle two days later when the British tried to force the passage to the Machersfontein hills and relieve the siege of Kimberley. Lothar de la Rey was five days past his fourteenth birthday on the dawn of the battle, and he killed his first Englishman before six that morning. It had been a less difficult target than a hundred Springbok and running Kuru had offered him before. Lothar, one of the five hundred picked marksmen, had stood to the parapet of the trench that he had helped dig along the foot of the Marchesfontein hills. The idea of digging a trench and using it as cover had at first repelled the Boers, who were essentially horsemen and loved to range fast and wide. Yet General Delaray had persuaded them to try this new tactic, 
and the lines of advancing English infantry had walked unsuspectingly onto the trenches in the deceptive early light. Leading the advance towards where Lothar lay was a powerful, thick-set man with flaming red mutton-chop whiskers. He strode a dozen paces ahead of the line, his kilt swinging jauntily, a tropical pith-helmet set at a rakish angle over one eye, and a bared sword in his right hand. At that moment the sun rose over the Marcus Fontaine hills, and its ripe orange light flooded the open featureless felt. It lit the ranks of advancing Boer highlanders like a stage effect, perfect shooting light, and the Boers had paced out the range in front of their trenches and marked them with cairns of stones. Lothar took his aim on the centre of the Englishman's forehead, but like the men beside him was held by a strange reluctance, for there seemed not much short of murder. Then, almost at its own volition, the Mauser jumped against his shoulder, and the crack of the shot seemed to come from very far away. The British officer's helmet sprang from his head and spun end over end. He was driven back a pace, and his arms flew open. The sound of the bullet striking the man's skull came back to Lothar, like a ripe watermelon, dropped onto a stone floor. The sword flashed in the sunlight as it fell from the soldier's hand. Then, with a slow, almost elegant pirouette, he sank into the low, coarse scrub. Hundreds of Highlanders had lain pinned in front of the trenches all that day. Not a man of them dared lift his head, for the waiting rifles in the trenches a hundred paces from where they lay were wielded by some of the finest marksmen in the world. The African sun burned the backs of their knees below the kilts until they swelled, and the skin burst open like overripe fruit. The wounded Highlanders cried for water, and some of the Boers in the trenches threw their water bottles towards them, but they fell short. Though Lothar had killed fifty men since then, that was the day he would remember all his life. He always marked it as the day he had become a man. Lothar was not among those who had thrown his water bottle. Instead, he had shot dead two of the Englishmen as they wriggled forward on their bellies to try and reach the water bottles. His hatred of the English, learned at the knees of both his mother and his father, had truly begun to flower that day, and had come into full fruiting in the years that followed. The English had hunted him and his father like wild animals across the felt. His beloved aunt and three female cousins had died of diphtheria, the white sore throat in the English concentration camps, but Lothar had made himself believe the story that the English had put fishhooks in the bread that they fed the Boer women to rip out their throats. It was an English thing, this war on the women and the young girls and the children. He and his father and his uncles had fought on long after all hope of victory was gone. The bitter enders, they called themselves with pride. When the others, starved to walking skeletons, sick with dysentery and covered with the running ulcerations which they called felt sores, caused by exposure and malnutrition, dressed in their rags and sacking, with only three rounds apiece remaining in their bandoliers, had gone in to surrender to the English at Ferenachen, Pietrus de la Rey and his son Lothar, had not gone in with them. Witness my oath, O Lord of my people. Pietrus had stood bareheaded in the felt with his seventeen-year-old son Lothar beside him. The war against the English will never end. Thus I swear in your sight, O Lord God of Israel. Then he had placed the black leather-covered Bible in Lothar's hands and made him swear the same oath. The war against the English will never end. Lothar had stood beside his father as he cursed the traitors, the cowards who would no longer fight on. Louis Boerta and Yanni Smuts, even his own brother Kurs de la Rey, you would sell your people to the Philistine. May you live all your lives under the English yoke and all burn in hell for ten thousand years. Then the father and the boy had turned their backs and ridden away, towards the vast arid land that was the domain of imperial Germany, 
and left the others to make peace with England. Because both father and son were strong, hard workers, both of them endowed with natural shrewdness and courage, because Lothar's mother was a German of good family with excellent connections and some wealth, they had prospered in German southwest Africa. Pietrus de la Rey, Lothar's father, was a self-taught engineer of considerable skill and ingenuity. What he did not know he could improvise. The saying was, A boer mark altijd een plan. A boer will always make a plan. Through his wife's connections he obtained the contract to reconstruct the breakwater of Ludwigsbucht Harbour, and when that was successfully completed, the contract to build the railway line northwards from the Orange River to Windhoek, the capital of German southwest. He taught Lothar his engineering skills. The boy learned swiftly, and by the age of twenty-one was a full partner in the construction and road-building company of de la Rey and son. His mother, Christina de la Rey, selected a pretty blonde German girl of good family and moved her diplomatically into her son's orbit, and they were married before Lothar's twenty-third birthday. She bore Lothar a beautiful blonde son, on whom he doted. Then the English intruded upon their lives once more, threatening to plunge the entire world into war by opposing the legitimate ambitions of the German Empire. Lothar and his father had gone to Governor Zeitz with an offer to build up, at their own expense, supply dumps in the remote areas of the territory to be used by the German forces to resist the English invasion, which would surely come from the Union of South Africa, now governed by those traitors and turncoat smarts, and Louis Boerter. There had been a German naval captain in Windhoek at the time. He had quickly recognised the value of the Delaray offer and prevailed on the governor to accept it. He had sailed with the father and son along that dreadful littoral that so well deserved the name Skeleton Coast to select a site for a base from which German naval vessels could refuel and revictual even after the ports of Ludwigsbucht and Wolfis Bay were captured by the Union forces. They discovered a remote and protected bay three hundred miles north of the tenuous settlements at Wolfis Bay and Swakopmund, a site almost impossible to reach overland, for it was guarded by the fiery deserts. They loaded a small coastal steamer with the naval stores sent out to them secretly from Bremerhaven in a German cruise ship. There were five hundred tons of fuel oil in forty-four gallon drums, engine spares and canned foods, small arms and ammunition, nine-inch naval shells, and fourteen of the long Mark Seven acoustic torpedoes to rearm the German U-boats if they should ever operate in these southern oceans. These supplies were ferried ashore and buried amongst the towering dunes. The lighters were painted with protective tar and buried with the stores. This secret supply base was finally established only weeks before the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated at Sarajevo, and the Kaiser was forced to move against the Serbian revolutionaries to protect the interests of the German Empire. Immediately, France and Britain had seized upon this as a pretext for precipitating the war after which they had been lusting. Lothar and his father saddled their horses and called out their Hottentot servants, kissed their women and Lothar's son farewell, and rode out on commando against the English and their Unionist minions once again. They were six hundred strong, riding under the Boer General Maritz, when they reached the Orange River and built their lager, and waited for the moment to strike. Each day armed men rode in to join them, tough, bearded men, proud, hard fighters with the Mausers slung on their shoulders, and the bandoliers of ammunition criss-crossing their wide chests. After each joyous greeting, they gave their news, and it was all good. The old comrades were flocking to the cry of Commando. Everywhere Boers were repudiating the treacherous peace which Schmatz and Boerter had negotiated with the English. All the old Boer generals were taking to the field. De Vett was camped at Mushroom Valley. Kemp was at Trierfontein with eight hundred. Bayers and Fury were all out and had declared for Germany against England. Smuts and Boerter seemed reluctant to precipitate a conflict between Boer and Boer, 
for the Union forces consisted of 70% Dutch-born soldiers. They were begging, wheedling and pleading with the rebels, sending envoys to their camps, prostrating themselves in the attempt to avoid bloodshed. But each day the rebel forces grew stronger and more confident. Then a message reached them, carried by a horseman riding in great haste across the desert from Windhoek. It was a message from the Kaiser himself, relayed to them by Governor Zeitz. Admiral Graf von Spee, with his squadron of battle cruisers, had won a devastating naval battle at Coronel on the Chilean coast. The Kaiser had ordered von Spee to round the Horn and cross the southern Atlantic to blockade and bombard the South African ports in support of their rebellion against the English and the Unionists. They stood under the fierce desert sun and cheered and sang, united and sure of their cause and certain of their victory. They were waiting only for the last of the Boer generals to come in to join them before they marched on Pretoria. Kurs de la Rey, Lothar's uncle, grown old and feeble and indecisive, had still not come in. Lothar's father sent messages to him, urging him to do his duty. But he vacillated, swayed by the treacherous oratory of Yanni Smuts and his misguided love and loyalty for Louis Boerta. Kun Britz was the other Boer leader they were waiting for. That giant of granite, standing six foot six inches tall, who could drink a bottle of fiery Cape smoke the way a lesser man might quaff a mug of ginger beer, who could lift a trek ox off its feet spit a stream of tobacco juice a measured twenty paces, and with his mauser hit a running springbok at two hundred paces. They needed him, for a thousand fighting men would follow him when he decided which way to ride. However, Yanni Smuts sent this remarkable man a message. Call out your commander, Umkun, and ride with me. The reply was immediate. Yeah. My old friend, we are mounted and ready to ride. But who do we fight? Germany or England? So they lost Brits to the Unionists. Then Kurs de la Rey, travelling to a final meeting with Yanni Smuts at which he would make his decision, ran into a police roadblock outside Pretoria and instructed his chauffeur to drive through it. The police marksman shot him in the head. So they lost de la Rey. Of course, Yanni Smuts, that cold, crafty devil, had an excuse. He said that the roadblock had been ordered to prevent the escape of the notorious band of bank robbers, the Foster Gang, from the area, and that the police had opened fire on a mistaken identity. However, the rebels knew better. Lothar's father had wept openly when they received the news of his brother's murder, and they had known that there was no turning back. No further chance. For parley, they would have to carry the land at rifle point. The plan was for all the rebel commandos to join up with Maritz on the Orange River, but they had underestimated the new mobility of the forces against them, afforded by the petrol-driven motor car. They had forgotten also that Burta and Smuts had long ago proved themselves the most able of all the Boer generals. When at last they moved... These two moved with the deadly speed of angry mumbas. They caught de Vett at Mushroom Valley and smashed his commando with artillery and machine guns. They were terrible casualties, and de Vett fled into the Kalahari, pursued by Kun Britz and a motorized column that captured him at Waterberg in the desert. Then the Unionists swung back and engaged Bayers and his commando near Rustenburg. Once the battle was lost, Bayers tried to escape by swimming the flooded Vaal River. His bootlaces became entangled, and they found his body three days later on the bank downstream. On the Orange River, Lothar and his father waited for the inevitable onslaught, but bad news reached them before the Unionists did. The English admiral, Sir Dovton Sturdy, had intercepted von Spee at the Falkland Islands and sunk his great cruisers Scharnhorst and Gneisenau 
and the rest of his squadron with only ten British seamen killed. The rebels' hope of succour had gone down with the German fleet. Still, they fought doggedly when the Unionists came, but it was in vain. Lothar's father took a bullet through the gut, and Lothar carried him off the field, and tried to get him back across the desert to Vintuk, where Christina could nurse him. It was five hundred miles of terrible going through the waterless wastes. The old man's pain was so fierce that Lothar wept for him, and the wound was contaminated by the contents of his perforated intestines, and mortified so that the stench brought the hyenas howling around the camp at night. But he was a tough old man, and it took him many days to die. Promise me, my son, he demanded with his last breath that stank of death. Promise me that the war with the English will never end. I promise you, father. Lothar leaned over him to kiss his cheek, and the old man smiled and closed his eyes. Lothar buried him under a camel-thorn tree in the wilderness. He buried him deeply, so that the hyena would not smell him and dig him up. Then he rode on home to Vintuk. Colonel Frank, the German commander, recognised Lothar's value, and asked him to raise a levy of scouts. Lothar assembled a small band of hardy Boers, German settlers, Bonnelswart Hottentots, and black tribesmen, and took them out into the desert to await the invasion of Unionist troops. Smuts and Boerter came with 45,000 men, and landed at Swakopmund and Ludertsbucht. From there they drove into the interior, employing their usual tactics, lightning-forced marshes, often without water for great distances, double-pronged attacks and encircling movements, using the new-fangled petrol-driven motor-cars, the same way they had used horses during the Boer War. Against this multitude, Frank had 8,000 German troops to defend a territory of over 300,000 square miles, with a 1,000-mile coastline. Lothar and his scouts fought the Unionists with their own tactics, poisoning the waterholes ahead of the Union troops, dynamiting the railway lines, hooking around them to attack their supply lines, setting ambushes and landmines, raiding at night and at dawn, driving off the horses, pushing his scouts to even their far borders of endurance. It was all unavailing. Buerta and Smuts caught the tiny German army between them, and with the casualty list of only 530 dead and wounded, exacted an unconditional surrender from Colonel Frank, but not from Lothar de la Rey. To honour the promise he had made to his father, he took what remained of his band of scouts northwards into the dreaded Cacao Felt to continue the struggle. Lothar's mother, Christina, and his wife and child went into the internment camp for German nationals that were set up by the Unionists at Windhoek. And there, all three of them died. They died in a typhoid epidemic, but Lothar de la Rey knew who was ultimately to blame for their deaths, and in the desert he cherished and nourished his hatred, for it was all that he had left. His family was slain by the English, and his estate seized and confiscated. Hatred was the fuel that drove him forward. He was thinking of his murdered family now, as he stood at his horse's head on the crest of one of the high dunes that overlooked the green Atlantic Ocean, where the Benguela current steamed in the early sunlight. His mother's face seemed to rise out of the twisting fog banks before him. She had been a beautiful woman, tall and statuesque, with thick blonde hair that hung to her knees when she brushed it out but which she wore twisted into thick, plaited golden ropes on top of her head to enhance her height. Her eyes had been golden also, with a direct cold gaze of a leopardess. She could sing like one of the Valkyries from Wagner, and she had passed on to Lothar her love of music and learning and art. She had passed on to him also her fine looks, classical, 
Teutonic features and the dense curls that now hung to his shoulders from under the wide Terai hat with the waving bunch of ostrich feathers stuck jauntily in the puggaree. Like Christina's, his hair was the colour of newly minted bronze, but his eyebrows were thick and dark over the golden leopard eyes that were now probing the silver mists of the Benguela. The beauty of the scene moved Lothar, the way that music could, like the violins playing Mozart. It induced in him the same feeling of mystic melancholy at the centre of his soul. The sea was green and still, not a ripple spoiled in its velvety sheen. The low and gentle sound of the ocean swelled and subsided like the breathing of all creation. Yet, along the shoreline, the dense growth of dark sea kelp absorbed the sea's motion, and there was no break of white water. The kelp beds danced a slow, graceful minuet, bowing and undulating to the rhythm of the ocean. The horns of the bay were armed with rock, split into geometric shapes and streaked white with the droppings of the seabirds and seals that basked upon them. The coats of the seal glowed in the mist-filtered sunlight, and their weird honking cries carried on the windless air to where Lothar stood on the crest of the dune high above them. In the throat of the bay the rock gave way to tawny lion-coloured beach, and behind the first dune was trapped a wide lagoon, hemmed in by nodding reed-beds, the only green in this landscape. In its shallow waters there waded troops of long-legged flamingo. The marvellous pink of their massed formations burned like unearthly fire, drawing Lothar's gaze away from his search of the sea. The flamingo were not the only birds upon the lagoon. There were troops of pelican and white egrets, solitary blue herons and a legion of smaller long-legged waders foraging the food-rich waters. The dunes upon which Lothar waited rose like the crested back of a monstrous serpent, writhing and twisting along the shoreline, rising five hundred feet and more against the misty sky, their restless, ever-changing bulk sculptured by the sea-wind into soft plastic coils and knife-sharp peaks. Suddenly, Far out on the sea there was a dark boil of movement, and the silky green surface changed to the colour of gunmetal. Lothar felt the jump of his nerves and the race of anticipation through his veins as his gaze darted to it. Was this what he had waited and kept vigil for all these weary weeks? He lifted the binoculars that hung upon his chest and felt a slide of disappointment. What he had seen was merely a shoal of fish, but what a shoal! The tip-top of the living mass dimpled the surface, but, as he watched, the rest of the vast shoal rose to feed on the rich green plankton, and the commotion spread out until as far as he could see, to the edge of the fog banks three miles out. The ocean seethed and boiled with life. It was a shoal of pilchards five miles across, each individual only as long as a man's open hand, but in their countless millions generating the power to move the ocean. Over this mighty multitude, the yellow-headed gannets and hysterical gulls shrieked and wheeled and plunged, their bodies kicking up white puffs of spray as they hit the water. Squadrons of seals charged back and forth like the cavalry of the sea, breaking the water white as they gorged on the silver masses, and through this gluttonous chaos the triangular fins of the great sharks passed with the stately motion of tall sailing ships. For an hour Lothar watched in wonder, and then abruptly, as though at a signal, the entire living mass sounded, and within minutes the stillness descended over the ocean again. The only movement was the gentle swell of waters and the soft advance and retreat of the silver fog banks under the watery sun. Lothar hobbled his horse, took a book from his saddlebag and settled on the warm sand. Every few minutes he raised his eyes from the page, but the hours wore away and at last he stood and stretched and went to his horse. His fruitless vigil ended for another day. With one foot in the stirrup, he paused and made a last careful survey of a seascape smudged to bloody carnelian and dull brass.
by the sunset. Then, even as he watched, the sea opened before his eyes, and out of it rose an enormous dark shape, in the image of Leviathan, but greater than any living denizen of the oceans. Shining with wetness, gleaming water streaming from its decks and steel sides, it wallowed upon the surface. At last, Lotus shouted with excitement and relief, I thought they would never come. He stared avidly through his monoculars at the long, sinister black vessel. He saw the encrustations of barnacle and weed that fouled the hull. She had been long at sea and battered by the elements. On the tall conning tower her registration numerals were almost obliterated. U-32. Lothar read them with difficulty, and then his attention was diverted by activity on the submarine's foredeck. From one of the hatches, a gun team swarmed out and ran forward to man the quick-firing cannon near the bows. They were taking no chances. Lothar saw the weapons traverse towards him, ready to reply to any hostile gesture from the shore. On the conning tower, human heads appeared, and he saw binoculars trained towards him. Hastily, Lothar found the signal rocket in his saddlebag. Its glowing red fireball arced out over the sea and was answered immediately by a rocket from the submarine hurling skywards on a tail of smoke. Lothar flung himself onto the back of his mount and pushed him over the edge of the dune. They went sliding down, the horse squatting on its haunches and bringing down a slipping, hissing cascade of sand around them. At the bottom of the dune, Lothar gathered his mount and they went flying across the hard, damp beach, with Lothar waving his hat, standing in the stirrups and shouting with laughter. He rode into the camp at the edge of the lagoon and sprang from the saddle. He ran from one of the crude shelters of driftwood and canvas to the next, dragging out his men and kicking them from their blankets. They have come, you sleeping lizards! They have come, you pups of desert jackals! Come on, get off your buttocks before they rot! They were an unlikely gang of cutthroats that Lothar had assembled. Tall, muscled herreros, yellow Mongol-faced hottentots with slanted eyes, fierce koranas and sly handsome avambos, dressed in tribal finery and the lootings of the battlefields, in cloaks of softly tanned hide of kudu and zebra, in the feathers of ostrich and the tattered tunics and helmets of the Union soldiers they had killed. Armed with Mandlicha and Mauser and Martini Henry and Lee Enfield 303s, with knife and spear, they were as bloodthirsty as hunting dogs, as wild and savage and unpredictable as the desert that had spawned them. They called only one man their master. If any other had lifted a hand to them, or spurned them with his foot, they would have slit his throat or put a ball through the back of his skull. But Lothar de la Rey kicked them to their feet and drove the laggards before him with his fists. "'Move, you devourers of hyena dung! The English will be upon you before you have finished scratching your lice!' The two lighters were hidden in the reeds. They had come up on the transport with the rest of the stores in those heady days just before the outbreak of war. In the weeks that they had waited for the U-boat, his men had re-corked the seams with oakum and tar and fashioned rollers from the driftwood that littered the beaches. Now, at Lothar's urging, they dragged the sturdy wooden boats from the reeds, twenty men straining at each side, for the boats were heavy. They had been built to carry forty tons of guano each, and still stank of seabird droppings. They had wide beam and deep draught, and the wooden rollers laid across the beach sank into the tawny sand as the weight of the hulls passed over them. They left the two boats at the edge of the water and then hurried back to where the drums of fuel oil were buried, at the foot of the dune. They heaved them from the damp sand and rolled them down the beach. Already Lothar had rigged a tripod and tackle, and the forty-four-gallon drums were hoisted and lowered into the lighters. As they worked, the light faded away into the desert night, and the submarine merged with the darkness of the ocean. "'Everybody to help launch!' Lothar bellowed and his men swarmed out of the darkness and began the rhythmic work chant, each concerted heave moving the heavily laden lighter a few inches forward, until the water lifted her and she'd slid forward and floated free. Lothar stood in the bows 
with a storm lantern held high, and his oarsmen drove the lighter, almost gunwale deep, through the cold black waters. In the blackness ahead, a signal lamp flashed to guide them, and then abruptly the high dark bulk of the U-boat loomed out of the night, and the lighter bumped against its side. The German seamen were ready with mooring lines, and one of them gave Lothar an arm as he leaped the gap and scrambled up the steep steel side. The U-boat captain was waiting for him on the bridge. Unter Seeboot Kapitän Kurt Kohler. He clicked his heels and saluted, and stepped forward to shake Lothar's hand. I am very happy to see you, Herr Delare. We have only enough fuel oil left for two days' steaming. In the glow of the bridge light, the submariner was gaunt-faced. His skin had the waxy pallor of a creature that had lived away from the light for a long time. His eyes had sunk into dark cavities, and his mouth was like the scar from a saber cut. Lothar could recognize that here was a man who had come intimately to understand death and fear there in the dark and secret depths. You have had a successful cruise, Captain. One hundred and twenty-six days at sea and twenty-six thousand tons of enemy shipping, the submariner nodded. With God's help, another twenty-six thousand tons, Lothar suggested. With God's help and your fuel oil, the captain agreed, and glanced down at the deck where the first drums were being swayed aboard. Then he looked back at Lothar. You have torpedoes? he asked anxiously. Content yourself, Lothar reassured him. The torpedoes are ready, but I thought it prudent to refuel before rearming. Of course. Neither of them had to mention the consequence of the U-boat, with her tanks empty, being caught against a hostile shore by an English warship. I still have a little schnapps, the captain changed the subject. My officers and I would be honoured. As Lothar descended the steel ladder into the submarine's interior, he felt his gorge rise. The stench was a solid thing, so that he wondered that any man could endure it more than a few minutes. It was the smell of sixty men living in a confined space for months on end, living without sunlight or fresh air, without the means of washing their bodies or their clothing. It was the smell of pervading damp and of the fungus that turned their uniforms green and rotted the cloth of their bodies, the stench of hot fuel oil and bilges, of greasy food and the sickly sweet of fear, the clinging odour of bedding that had been slept in for one hundred and twenty-six days and nights, of socks and boots that were never changed, and the reek of sewage buckets which could only be emptied once every twenty-four hours. Lothar hid his revulsion and clicked his heels and bowed when the captain introduced his junior officers. The overhead deck was so low that Lothar had to hunch his head down on his shoulders, and the space between the bulkheads was so narrow that the two men were forced to turn sideways to pass each other. He tried to imagine living in these conditions and found his face beading with cold sweat. Do you have any intelligence of enemy shipping, Herr Delare? The captain poured a tiny measure of schnapps into each of the crystal glasses and sighed when the last drop fell from the bottle. I regret that my intelligence is seven days old. Lothar saluted the naval officers with a raised glass, and when they had all drunk, went on. The troopship Auckland docked at Durban eight days ago, for bunkers. She is carrying two thousand New Zealand infantry, and was expected to sail again on the 15th. There were many sympathisers in the civil service of the Union of South Africa, men and women whose fathers and family had fought in the Boer War and had ridden with Maritz and De Wet against the Union troops. Some of them had relatives who had been imprisoned and even executed for treason once Smuts and Boerter had crushed the rebellion. Many of these were employed by the South African Railway and Harbours Authority. Others had key positions in the Department of Post and Telegraphs. Thus vital information was gathered and swiftly encoded and disseminated to German agents and rebel activists over the Union government's own communication network. Lothar reeled off the list of arrivals and sailings from South African ports, and again apologised. My information is received at the telegraph station at Okahanya, but it takes five to seven days for it to be carried across the desert by one of my men. I understand, the German captain nodded. 
Nevertheless, the information you have given me will be invaluable in helping me plan the next stage of my operations. He looked up from the chart on which he had been marking the enemy dispositions, which Lothar had given him, and for the first time noticed his guest's discomfort. He kept his expression attentive and courteous, but inwardly he gloated. You great hero! "'handsome as an opera star, so brave out there with the wind in your face "'and the sun shining over your head. "'I wish I could take you with me and teach you the true meaning of courage and sacrifice. "'How would you like to hear the English destroyers go drumming overhead as they hunt you? "'How would you like to hear the click of the primer as the death charge sinks down towards you? "'Oh, I would enjoy watching your face when the blast beats against the pressure hull "'and water squirts in through the cracks and the lights go out.' How would you like to smell yourself shit with fear in the dark and feel it running hot and liquid down your legs? Instead, he smiled and murmured, I wish I was able to offer you a little more schnapps. No, no. Lothar waved the offer aside. This corpse-faced creature and his stinking vessel disgusted and sickened him. You have been most gracious. I must go ashore and supervise the loading. These Schwarzers, you cannot trust them. Lazy dogs and born thieves, all of them. They understand only the whip and the goad. Lothar escaped thankfully up the ladder, and in the conning tower sucked the sweet cool night air greedily into his lungs. The submarine captain followed him up. Here, de la Rey, it is essential that we complete the bunkering and stores before dawn. You realize how vulnerable we are here, how helpless we would be, trapped against the shore with our hatches open and our tanks empty? If you could send some of your seamen ashore to assist with the loading. The captain hesitated. Placing his valuable crew on land would make him more vulnerable still. He weighed the odds swiftly. War was all a gambler's throw. Risk against reward. The stakes of death and glory. I will send twenty men to the beach with you. He made the decision in seconds, and Lothar, who had understood his quandary, nodded with reluctant admiration. They had to have light. Lothar built a bonfire of driftwood on the beach, but built a screen between it and the sea, trusting on this and the hovering fog banks to shield them from any searching English warships. By the diffused glow they loaded and reloaded the lighters, and rowed them out to the submarine. As each drum of fuel oil was funneled into the vessel's tanks, the empty canister was holed and thrown overboard to sink into the kelp beds, and gradually the long, slim vessel sank lower in the water. It was four in the morning before the fuel tanks were brimming, and the U-boat captain fretted and fumed on his bridge, glancing every few seconds towards the land, where the false dawn was giving a hard knife-edge to the dark crests of the dunes, and then down again to the approaching lighter with the long, glistening shape of a torpedo balanced delicately across the thwarts. Hurry! He leaned over the gunwale of the conning tower to urge on his men, as they fitted the slings around the monstrous weapon, gingerly took the weight on the straining tackle and swung it on board. The second lighter was already alongside with its murderous burden, and the first lighter was thrashing back towards the beach, as the torpedo was eased, gently, into the forward hatch and slid into the empty tube below deck. Swiftly, the light strengthened, and the efforts of the crew and the black guerrillas became frantic as they fought off their fatigue and struggled to complete the loading before full daylight exposed them to their enemies. Lothar rode out with the last torpedo, sitting casually astride, its shining back as though upon his Arab, and the captain watching him in the dawn found himself resenting him more fiercely, hating him for being tall and sun-gilded and handsome, hating him for his casual arrogance and for the ostrich feathers in his hat and the golden curls that hung to his shoulders, but hating him most of all because he would ride away into the desert and leave the U-boat commander to go down again into the cold and deadly waters. Captain! Lothar scrambled out of the lighter and climbed the ladder to the bridge of the conning tower. The captain realised that his handsome face was glowing with excitement. Captain, one of my men has just ridden into camp. He has been five days reaching me from Okahanya, and he has news. Splendid news. 
The captain tried not to let the excitement infect him, but his hands began to tremble as Lothar went on. The assistant arbormaster at Cape Town is one of our men. They are expecting the English heavy battle cruiser Inflexible to reach Cape Town within eight days. She left Gibraltar on the 5th and is sailing direct. The captain dived back into the hatch, and Lothar suppressed his repugnance and followed him down the steel ladder. The captain was already bending eagerly over the chart table with the dividers in his hands, firing questions at his navigating officer. Give me the cruising speed of the enemy. I, class, battle cruisers. The navigator thumbed swiftly through intelligence files. Estimated twenty-two knots or two hundred and sixty revolutions, Captain. Ha! The captain was chalking in the approximate course from Gibraltar down the western coastline of the African continent, around the Great Bulge, and then on to the Cape of Good Hope. Ha! Again, this time with delight and anticipation. We can be in patrol position by eighteen hundred hours today if we sail within the hour, and she cannot possibly have passed by then. He raised his head from the chart and looked at his officers, crowded around him. An English battle cruiser, gentlemen, but not an ordinary one. The Inflexible, the same ship that sank the Scharnhorst at the Falkland Islands. A prize! What a prize for us to take to the Kaiser and das Vaterland! Except for the two lookouts in the wings, Captain Kurt Kohler stood alone in the conning tower of U-32 and shivered in the cold sea mist despite the thick white roll-neck sweater he wore under his blue pea-jacket. Start main engine secure to diving stations. He bent to the voice tube and immediately his lieutenant's confirmation echoed back to him. Start main engine secure to diving stations. The deck trembled under Kohler's feet, and the diesel exhaust blurted above his head. The oily reek of burned fuel oil made his nostrils flare. "'Ship ready to dive!' The lieutenant's voice confirmed, and Kohler felt as though a crushing burden had been lifted from his back. How he had fretted through those helpless and vulnerable hours of refueling and rearming! However, that was past— once again the ship was alive beneath his feet, ready to his hand, and relief buoyed him up above his fatigue. Revolutions for seven knots, he ordered. New course, 270 degrees. As his order was repeated, he tipped his cap with his gold-braided peak onto the back of his head and turned his binoculars towards land. Already the heavy wooden lighters had been dragged away and hidden amongst the dunes. There remained only the drag marks of their keels in the sand. The beach was empty, except for a single mounted figure. As Kola watched him, Lothar de la Rey lifted the wide-brimmed hat from his brazen curls, and the ostrich feathers fluttered as he waved. Kola lifted his own right hand in salute, and the horseman swung away, still brandishing his hat, and galloped into the screen of reeds that choked the valley between two soaring dunes. A cloud of waterfowl, alarmed by the horseman, rose from the surface of the lagoon and milled in a gaudily coloured cloud above the forbidding dunes, and the horse and rider disappeared. Kola turned his back upon the land, and the long-pointed bows of the U-boat sliced into the standing curtains of the silver fog. The hull was shaped like a sword, a broadsword one hundred and seventy feet long, to be driven at the throat of the enemy by her great six hundred horsepower diesel engine, and Kola did not try to suppress the choking sense of pride that he always felt at the beginning of a cruise. He was under no illusion, but that the outcome of this global conflict rested upon him and his brother officers in the submarine service. It was in their power alone to break the terrible stalemate of the trenches, where two vast armies faced each other like exhausted heavyweight boxers, neither having enough strength left to lift their arms to throw a decisive punch 
slowly rotting in the mud and decay of their own monstrous strivings. It was these slim and secret and deadly craft that could still wrest victory out of despair and desperation before the breaking point was reached, if only the Kaiser had decided to use his submarines to their full potential from the very beginning. Kurt Kohler brooded. How different the outcome might have been. In September 1914, the very first year of the war, a single submarine, the U-9, had sunk three British cruisers in quick succession. But even with this conclusive demonstration, the German High Command had hesitated to use the weapon that had been placed in their hands, fearful of the outrage and condemnation of the entire world, of the simplistic cry of the beastly underwater butchers. Of course, the American threats after the sinking of the Lusitania and Arabic for the loss of American lives had served also to constrain the use of the undersea weapon. The Kaiser had feared to arouse the sleeping American giant and to have its mighty weight hurled against the German Empire. Now, when it was almost too late, the German high command had at last let slip the U-boats, and the results were staggering, surpassing even their own expectations. The last three months of 1916 saw more than 300,000 tons of Allied shipping go down before the torpedoes. That was only a beginning. In the first ten days of April 1917 alone, another incredible 250,000 tons was destroyed. 875,000 tons for the full month. The Allies were reeling under this fearful infliction. Now that two million fresh and eager young American troops were ready to cross the Atlantic to join the conflict, it was the duty of every officer and seaman of the German submarine service to make whatever sacrifice was demanded of him. If the gods of war chose to place a British heavy battle cruiser of such illustrious lineage as the inflexible on a converging course with his battered little vessel, Kurt Kohler would gladly give up his own life and the lives of his crew for an opportunity to empty his torpedo tubes at her. Revolutions for twelve knots, Kurt spoke into the voice tube. That was the U-32's top surface speed. He had to get into patrol position as swiftly as possible. His calculations indicated that the inflexible must pass between 110 and 140 nautical miles offshore, but Kurt refused to calculate his chances of making a good interception, even if he reached the patrol area before the cruiser passed by. The horizon from the U-32's lookout wings was a mere seven miles, the range of her torpedoes 2,500 yards, the quarry capable of a sustained speed of 22 knots or more. He had to manoeuvre his vessel within 2,500 yards of the speeding cruiser, but the chances were many thousands of times against him even sighting her. Even if he obtained a sighting, it would probably be only to watch the distinctive tripod-shaped superstructure of the cruiser pass hull down on his limited horizon. He thrust his forebodings aside. Lieutenant Horsthausen to the bridge. When his first officer clambered up to the bridge, Kurt gave him orders to drive out to the patrol area with all possible speed, with the ship secured to diving stations ready for instant action. Call me at 1830 hours if there is no change. Kurt's exhaustion was aggravated by the dull headache from the diesel fumes. He took one last look around the horizon before going below. The fog banks were being stripped away by the rising wind. The sea was darkening, its anger rising at the whip of the elements. The U-32 thrust her bows into the next swell, and white water broke over her foredeck. Spray splattered icily into Kurt's face. "'The glass is dropping swiftly, sir,' Horsthausen told him quietly. "'I think we are in for a sharp blow.' "'Stay on the surface. Maintain speed.' Kurt ignored the opinion. He didn't want to hear anything that might complicate the hunt. He slid down the ladder and went immediately to the ship's logbook on the chart table. He made his entry in his meticulous formal script. Course 270 degrees, speed 12 knots, wind northwest 15 knots and freshening. Then he signed it with his full signature and pressed his fingers into his temples to still the ache 
within his skull. My God, I am tired, he thought, and then saw the navigation officer watching his reflection surreptitiously in the polished brass of the main control panel. He dropped his hands to his sides, brushed aside the temptation to go to his bunk immediately, and instead told his coxswain, I will inspect the ship. He made a point of stopping in the engine compartment to compliment the engineers on the swift and efficient refuelling procedure, and in the torpedo compartment, in the bows, he ordered the men to remain in their bunks when he stooped in through the narrow entrance. The three torpedo tubes were loaded and under compression, and the spare torpedoes were stacked in the narrow space. Their long, shiny bulk almost filled the entire cabin and made any movement difficult. The torpedo men would be forced to spend much of their time crouched in their tiny bunks like animals in a tier of cages. Kurt patted one of the torpedoes. We'll make more room for you soon, he promised them, just as soon as we mail these little parcels off to Tommy. It was an antique joke, but they responded dutifully, and, noting the timbre of their laughter, Kurt realized how those few hours on the surface in the sweet desert air had refreshed and enlivened them all. Back in the tiny curtained cubicle which was his cabin, he could let himself relax at last, and instantly his exhaustion overcame him. He had not slept for forty hours. Every minute of that time he had been exposed to constant nervous strain. Still before he crawled laboriously into his narrow confined bunk, he took down the framed photograph from its niche above his desk and studied the image of the placid young woman and the small boy at her knee dressed in lederhosen. Good night, my darlings, he whispered. Good night to you also, my other son, whom I have never seen. The diving klaxon woke him, bellowing like a wounded beast, echoing painfully in the confines of the steel hull, so that he was torn from deep black sleep and cracked his head on the jam of the bunk as he tried to struggle out of it. He was aware instantly of the pitch and roll of the hull. The weather had deteriorated, and then he felt the deck cant under his feet as the bows dropped and the submarine plunged below the surface. He ripped open the curtains and burst fully dressed into the control centre, just as the two lookouts came tumbling down the ladder from the bridge. The dive had been so swift that seawater cascaded down onto their heads and shoulders before Horsthausen could secure the main hatch in the tower. Kurt glanced at the clock at the top of the brass control panel as he took control. Eighteen twenty-three hours? He made the calculation and estimated that they must be one hundred nautical miles offshore on the edge of their patrol area. Horsthausen would probably have called him in another few minutes if he had not been forced to make this emergency dive. Periscope depth! He snapped at the senior helmsman, seated before the control panel, and used the few moments of respite to rally his senses and orientate himself fully by studying the navigational plot. "'Depth nine metres, sir,' said the helmsman, spinning the wheel to check her wild plunge. "'Up periscope!' Kurt ordered, as Horsthausen dropped down the tower, jumped off the ladder, and took up his action station at the attack table." The sighting is a large vessel showing green and red navigation lights bearing 060 degrees, he reported quietly to Kurt. I could make out no details. As the periscope rose up through the deck, the hydraulic rams hissing loudly, Kurt ducked down, unfolded the side handles, and pressed his face into the rubber pads, peering into the Zeiss lens of the eyepiece, and straightening his body to follow the telescope up, already swinging it onto the bearing marks, 060 degrees. The lens was obscured by water, and he waited for it to clear. Late twilight, he judged the light up there on the surface, and then to Horsthausen. Range estimate? Sighting is hull down. That meant she was probably eight or nine miles, but red and green navigation lights indicated that she was headed almost directly towards the U-32. 
That she should be showing light at all indicated the vessel's supreme confidence that she was alone on the ocean. The lens cleared of water, and Kurt traversed slowly. There she was. He felt his pulse leap, and his breathing check. It never failed, no matter how often he saw the enemy. The shock and the thrill was as intense as the very first time. Bearing mark, he snapped at Holsthausen, and the lieutenant entered the bearing on the attack table. Kurt stared at the quarry, feeling the hunger in his guts, the almost sexual ache in his loin, as though he were watching a beautiful, naked, and available woman. At the same time, he was gently manipulating the knob of the rangefinder with his right hand. In the lens of the periscope, the double images of the target ship were brought together by the rangefinder. Range mark! Kurt said clearly as the images coalesced into a single sharp silhouette. Bearing 075 degrees, said Horsthausen, range 7,650 meters, and entered the numerals into the attack table. Down periscope, now heading 340 degrees, ordered Kurt and the thick telescoping steel sections of the periscope hissed down into their well in the deck between his feet. Even at this range, and in the bad light, Kurt was taking no chances that a wary lookout might pick out the plume of spray thrown up by the tip of the periscope as it cut the surface, turning on to an interception course into the north. Kurt was watching the second hand of the clock on the control panel, he must give Horsthausen at least two minutes before he made his next sighting. He glanced across at his first officer and found him totally absorbed in his calculations, stopwatch in his right hand, left hand manipulating the tumblers of the attack table like a Chinaman with an abacus. Kurt switched his attention to his own calculations concerning the light and the surface condition of the sea. The fading light favoured him. As always, the hunter needed stealth and secrecy, but the rising sea would hamper his approach. Breaking over the lens of the periscope, it might even affect the running of his torpedoes. A periscope, he ordered. The two minutes had expired. He found the image almost instantly. Bearing mark? Range mark! Now Horsthausen had his references. Elapsed time between sights and the relative ranges and bearings of the submarine and its target, together with the U-32's own speed and course. Target is on a heading of 175 degrees, speed 22 knots, he read off the attack table. Kurt did not look away from the eyepiece of the periscope, but felt the thrill of the chase in his blood like the flush of strong spirits. The other ship was coming straight down on them, and its speed was almost exactly that to be expected of a British battle cruiser making a long passage. He stared at the distant image, but the light was going even as he studied the shadowy superstructure, just visible between the pinpricks of the navigational lights. And yet, and yet, he was not absolutely certain. Perhaps he was seeing what he wished to see, but there was a vague, triangular shape against the darkening sky, the sure tripod mark of the new I-Class battlecruiser. Down periscope! He made his decision. New heading, 355 degrees. The head-on course to intercept the target. Designate the target as the chase. That was the intimation to his officers that he was attacking, and he saw their expression turn wolfish in the subdued light, and they exchanged eager gloating glances. The chase is an enemy cruiser. We will attack with our bow tubes. Report battle stations. In quick succession, the reports came in assuring him of the instant readiness of the entire ship. Kurt nodded with satisfaction, standing facing the brass control panel, studying the dials over the heads of his seated helmsman, his hands thrust deeply into the pockets of his pea-jacket, so that their trembling did not portray his agitated excitement. But a nerve jumped in his lower eyelid, making him wink sardonically, and his thin, 
pale lips trembled uncontrollably. Each second seemed an eternity, until he could ask, "'Estimated bearing?' The seaman with the hydrophones over his ears looked up. He had been closely monitoring the distant sound of the chase's propellers. "'Bearing steady,' he replied, and Kurt glanced at Horsthausen. "'Estimated range?' Horsthausen kept all his attention on his attack table. "'Estimated range four thousand meters. Up periscope!' She was still there, exactly where he had expected her. She had not turned away. Kurt felt almost nauseated with relief. At any time that she suspected his presence, the chase could simply turn and run away from him, without even bothering to increase speed, and he would be helpless to stop her. But she was coming on, unsuspectingly. It was fully dark, in the world above the surface, and the sea was breaking and tumbling with white caps. Kurt had to make the decision which he had postponed to the last possible moment. He had made one last sweep of the entire horizon, swinging the handles of the periscope the full 360 degrees, shuffling around behind the eyepiece, satisfying himself that there was no other enemy creeping up behind his stern, no destroyers escorting the cruiser. And then he said, I will shoot from the bridge. Even Horsthausen glanced up momentarily, and he heard the sharp intake of breath from his junior officers when they realized they were going to surface almost under the bows of an enemy battlecruiser. Down, Periscope, Kurt ordered his senior helmsman. Reduce speed to five knots and come to tower depth. He saw the needles on the control dials tremble and then begin to move, the speed dropping back, the depth decreasing gently, and he moved across to the ladder. I am transferring to the bridge, he told Horsthausen, and stepped onto the ladder. He climbed nimbly, and at the top spun the locking wheel of the main hatch. As the submarine broke through the surface, the internal air pressure blew the hatch open, and Kurt sprang through it. The wind lashed him immediately, tugging at his clothing and blowing spray into his face. All about him the sea was breaking and boiling, and the ship rolled and wallowed. Kurt had relied on the turmoil of waters to disguise the disturbance that the U-32 would make as she surfaced. With one glance he satisfied himself that the enemy was almost dead ahead, and coming on swiftly and unswervingly. He bowed to the aiming table at the forward end of the bridge, unstoppered the voice pipe, and spoke into it. Prepare to attack. Stand by bow tubes. Bow tubes closed up. Horsthausen answered him from below, and Kurt began to feed him the details of range and bearing, while on the deck below the lieutenant read off from the attack table the firing heading and passed it on to the helmsman. The submarine's bows swung gradually as the helmsman kept her on the exact aiming mark. Range 2,500 meters, Kurt intoned. She was at extreme range now, but closing swiftly. There were lights burning on her upper decks, but apart from that she was merely a huge dark shape. There was no longer any definite silhouette against the night sky, although Kurt could make out the shapeless loom of her triple funnels. The lights troubled Kurt. No royal naval captain should be so negligent of the most elementary precautions. He felt a small chill wind of doubt cool his excitement and battle ardour. He stared at the enormous vessel through the spray and darkness, and for the first time in a hundred such dangerous, nerve-wracking situations, he felt himself hesitant and uncertain. The vessel before him was in the exact position and on the exact course where he had expected to find the inflexible. It was the right size. It had three funnels and a tripod superstructure. It was steaming at twenty-two knots, and yet it was showing lights. Repeat the range, Mark! Horsthausen spoke through the voice tube, gently prodding him, and Kurt started. He had been staring at the chase 
neglecting the rangefinder. Quickly he gave the decreasing range, and then realised that within thirty seconds he would have to make his final decision. "'I will shoot at one thousand metres,' he said into the voice tube. It was point-blank range. Even in this confused sea, there was no question of missing with one of the long, shark-like missiles. Kurt stared into the lens of the rangefinder, watching the numerals decreasing steadily as hunter and hunted came together. He drew a deep breath, like a diver about to plunge into the cold black waters, and then he raised his voice for the first time. Number one tube, loss! Almost immediately, Horsthausen's voice came back to him, with that slight, catchy stutter that always afflicted him when he was overexcited. Number one, fired and running! There was no sound, nor recoil, no movement of the submarine's hull to signal the release of the first torpedo. In the darkness and the breaking white waters, Kurt could not even distinguish the wake of the speeding torpedo. Number two tube, loss! Kurt was firing a spread of torpedoes, each on a minutely diverging course, the first aimed forward, the second amidships, the third aft. Number three tube, loss! All three fired and running! Kurt raised his eyes from the aiming table and slitted them against the flying spray and the wind as he gazed down the track of his torpedoes. It was standard service procedure to crash-dive immediately. All torpedoes were fired and to await the explosions of the hits down in the safety of the depths. But this time Kurt felt compelled to remain on top and watch it happen. "'Running time!' he demanded of Horsthausen watching the tall bulk of his victim festooned with lights like a cruise ship, so that she paled out of the fields of stars that sprinkled the black curtain of the sky behind her. Two minutes, fifteen seconds to run,' Horsthausen told him, and Kurt clicked down the button of his stopwatch. Always, in this time of waiting after his weapons were sped upon their way, the remorse assailed Kurt. Before the firing there was only the heat of the chase and the tingling excitement of the stalk, but now he thought of the brave men, brothers of the sea, whom he had consigned to the cold, dark, and merciless waters. The seconds dragged, so that he had to check the luminous dial of his stopwatch to assure himself that his torpedoes had not sounded or swerved nor run past. Then there was that vast blurt of sound which even when expected made him flinch, and he saw the pearly fountain of spray rise against the bulk of the battle cruiser, shining in the starlight and in the deck lights with a beautiful iridescent radiance. Number one! Hit! Horsthausen's shout of triumph came from the voice pipe, followed immediately by another thunderous roar, as though a mountain had fallen into the sea. Number two! Hit! And yet again, while the first two tall, shining columns of spray still hovered, the third leapt high in the dark air beside them. Number three! Hit! As Kurt still watched, the columns of spray mingled, subsided, and blew away on the wind, and the great ship ran on, seemingly unscathed. Chase is losing speed! Horsthausen exulted, altering course to starboard. The doomed ship began a wide, aimless turn into the wind it would not be necessary to fire their stern tubes. "'Lieutenant Horsthausen to the bridge,' Kurt said into the voice tube. It was a reward for a task perfectly performed. He knew how avidly the young lieutenant would relate every detail of the sinking to his brother officers later. The memory of this victory would sustain them all through the long days and nights of privation and hardship that lay ahead. Horsthausen burst from the hatch and stood shoulder to shoulder with his captain, peering at their monstrous victim. "'She has stopped!' he cried. The British ship lay like a rock in the sea. "'We will move closer,' Kurt decided, and relayed the order to the helmsman. The U-32 crept forward, butting into the creaming waves, only her conning tower above the surface, closing the range gradually.' 
and gingerly. The cruiser's guns might still be manned, and only a single lucky shot was needed to hold the submarine's thin plating. Listen! Kurt ordered abruptly, turning his head to catch the sounds that came to them faintly above the clamour of the wind. I hear nothing! Stop engines! Kurt ordered, and the vibration and hum of the diesel ceased. Now they could hear it more clearly. Voice us! Horsthausen whispered. It was a pathetic chorus, borne to them on the wind, the shouts and cries of men in dire distress, rising and falling on the vagaries of the wind, punctuated by a wild scream as somebody fell or leapt from the high deck. She is listing heavily. They were close enough to see her against the stars. She's sinking by the bows. The great stern was rearing out of the black. She's going quickly, very quickly. They could hear the crackle and rumble of her hull as the waters raced through her and twisted and distorted her plating. Man the searchlight, Kurt ordered, and Horsthausen turned to stare at him. Do you hear my order? Horsthausen roused himself. It went against all a submariner's instinct to betray himself so blatantly to the eyes of the enemy. But he crossed to the searchlight in the wing of the deck. "'Switch on!' Kurt urged him when he hesitated still, and the long white beam leapt out across half a mile of tempestuous sea and darkness. It struck the hull of the ship and was reflected in a dazzle of purest white. Kurt threw himself across the bridge and shouldered his lieutenant from the searchlight. He gripped the handles and swung the solid beam across and down, slitting his eyes against the dazzling reflection from the ship's paintwork. He searched frantically, and then froze, with his fingers hooked like claws over the searchlight handles. In the perfect round circle of the searchlight beam, the scarlet arms of the huge painted cross were outflung like the limbs of a condemned man upon the crucifix. Mother of the Almighty God, Kurt whispered, what have I done? With horrid fascination, he moved the beam slowly from side to side. The decks of the white ship were canted steeply towards him, so he could see the clusters of human figures that scurried about them, trying to reach the lifeboats dangling from their davits. Some of them were dragging stretchers, or leading stumbling figures dressed in long blue hospital robes, and their cries and supplications sounded like a colony of nesting birds at sunset. As Kurt watched, the ship suddenly tipped towards him with a rush, and the men on the decks were sent sliding across them, piling up against the railings. Then, singly and in clusters, they began to fall overboard. One of the lifeboats let go and dropped out of control to hit the water alongside the hull and immediately capsized. Still men were dropping from the high decks, and he could hear their faint shrieks above the wind, see the small spouts of white spray as they struck the water. "'What can we do?' Horsthausen whispered beside Kurt, staring with him down the searchlight beam, his expression pale and appalled. Kurt switched off the searchlight. After the intense light, the darkness was crushing. "'Nothing,' said Kurt in the darkness. "'There is nothing we can do.' and he turned and stumbled to the hatchway. By the time he reached the bottom of the ladder, he had control of himself again, and his voice was flat and his expression stony as he gave his orders. Lookouts to the bridge. Revolutions for twelve knots, new course, one hundred and fifty degrees. He stood at ease as they turned away from the sinking ship, fighting the urge to lift his hand to cover his eyes. He knew he could not shut out the cries and shrieks that still echoed in his skull. He knew he would never be able to shut them out, and that he would hear them again at the hour of his own death. "'Secure from action stations,' he said with dead eyes, his waxen features wet with spray and sweat. "'Resume patrol routine.'
Santan was perched on the foot of the lowest bunk in her favourite ward on sea deck. She had the book open on her lap. It was one of the larger cabins, with eight bunks, and all the young men in the bunks were spinals. Not one of them would ever walk again, and almost in defiance of this fact, they were the noisiest, gayest, and most opinionated bunch on board the Pretier Castle. Every evening during the hour before lights out, Santan read to them, or that was the intention. It usually only required a few minutes of the author's opinions to trigger a spirited debate which ran unchecked until the dinner gong finally intervened. Santan enjoyed these sessions as much as any of them, and she invariably chose a book on a subject about which she wanted to know more, always an African theme. This evening she had selected Volume 2, Le Vélan's Voyage dans l'intérieur de l'Afrique, in the original French. She translated directly from the page of Le Vélan's description of a hippopotamus hunt, which her audience followed avidly, until she reached the description, The female beast was flayed and cut up on the spot. I ordered a bowl to be brought me, which I filled with her milk. It appears to be much less disagreeable than that of the elephant, and the next day had changed almost wholly to cream. It had an amphibious taste, and a filthy smell, which gave disgust. But in coffee it was even pleasant. There were cries of revulsion from the bunks. My God! somebody exclaimed. Those Frenchies! Anybody who will drink hippo milk and eat frogs! Instantly they all turned upon him. Sunshine is a Frenchie, you dog. Apologize immediately. And a barrage of pillows were hurled across the cavern at the offender. Laughing, Santan jumped up to restore order. And as she did so, the deck buckled under her feet, and she was hurled backwards onto the bunk again, and the blast of a massive explosion ripped through the ship. Santan struggled up and was knocked down again by another explosion more violent than the first. What is happening? she screamed, and a third explosion plunged them into darkness, and threw her from the bunk onto the deck. In the utter darkness, somebody tumbled on top of her, pinning her in a welter of bedclothes. She felt herself suffocating, and she screamed again. The ship rang to other cries and shouts. Get off me! Santan fought to free herself, crawled to the doorway, and pulled herself upright. The pandemonium all around her, the rush of bodies in the dark, the shouts and senseless bawling of orders, the sudden terrifying tilt of the deck under Santan's feet, panicked her. She lashed out to protect herself as an unseen body crashed into her and then groped her way down the long, narrow corridor. The alarm bells began to ring through the darkness, a shrill, nerve-ripping sound that added to the confusion, and a voice roared, "'The ship is sinking! They're abandoning ship!' We'd be trapped down here. There was an immediate rush to the companionway, and Santan found herself borne along, helplessly, fighting to keep her balance, for she knew if she fell, she would be trampled. Instinctively she tried to protect her belly, but she was sent reeling into the bulkhead with a force that clashed her teeth, and she bit her own tongue. As she fell, her mouth filled with a sick metallic taste of blood, she flung out both hands, and they closed on the guide rail of the companionway, and she hung on with all her strength. She dragged herself up the staircase, sobbing with the effort to keep her feet in the crush of panic-stricken bodies. "'My baby!' she heard herself saying it aloud. "'You can't kill my baby!' The ship lurched, and there was the crackle and shriek of metal on metal, the crash of breaking glass, and the renewed rush and trample of feet all around her. "'It's going down!' shrieked a voice beside her. "'We've got to get out! Let me out!' The lights went on again, and she saw the companionway to the upper deck choked with struggling, cursing men. She felt bruised and crushed and helpless. "'My baby!' she sobbed as she was pinned against the bulkhead. The lights seemed to sober the men around her, slamming them out of their blind terror. "'Here, yeah, sunshine!' a voice bellowed. It was a big Afrikaner, one of her most fervent admirers, and he swung his crutch to forge an opening for her. "'Let her through! Stand back, you bastards! Let sunshine through!' Hands seized her, and she was lifted off her feet. "'Let sunshine through!' They passed her overhead like a doll. 
She lost her veil and one of her shoes. Yes, yeah, sunshine, pass her up! She found herself sobbing. She was jostled, and hard fingers seized her, and bit painfully into her flesh, but she was borne swiftly upwards. At the top of the companionway other hands grabbed her, and hustled her out to the open deck. It was dark out here, and the wind snatched at her hair and wrapped her skirts constrictingly about her legs. The deck was listing heavily, but as she stepped upon it, it cantered even more viciously, and she was hurled against a stanchion with a force that made her cry out. Suddenly, she thought about the helplessly maimed young men that she had left down there on sea deck. I should have tried to help them, she told herself, and then she thought of Anna. Hesitating and confused, she looked back. Men still swarmed up and out of the companionways. It would be impossible to move against that throng, and she knew that she did not have the strength needed to assist a man who could not walk himself. All around her the officers were trying to restore order, but most of these men who had stoically borne the hell of the trenches were terrified witless by the thought of being trapped in a sinking ship, and their faces were contorted and their eyes wild with unreasoning terror. However, there were others who were dragging out the cripples and the blind and leading them to the lifeboats along the rail. Clinging to the stanchion, Santan was torn with indecision and fear and horror for the hundreds of men below who knew they would never reach the deck. Then beneath her the ship rumbled and belched in its death throes. Air rushed from the holds beneath her waterline with the roarings of a sea monster and the sound decided Santan. My baby, she thought, I have to save him. The others don't matter. Only my baby. Sunshine! One of the officers had seen her, and he slid down the steep deck to her and put an arm around her protectively. You've got to get a lifeboat. The ship will go at any moment. With his free hand, he ripped open the tapes that secured his bulky canvas life jacket, and he pulled it off his shoulders and lifted it over Santan's head. What happened? Santan gasped as he knotted the tapes of the life jacket under her chin and down her chest. We've been torpedoed. Come on! He dragged her along with him, reaching for handholds, for it was impossible to stand unaided on the steep angle of the deck. That lifeboat! We've got to get you into it! Just ahead of them, a crowded lifeboat was swinging wildly on its davits. An officer was bellowing orders as they tried to clear the jam tackle. Looking down the ship's side... Santan saw the black sea boiling and foaming, and the wind blew her hair into her face and half blinded her. Then, from far out on the black waters, a solid white shaft of light burst over them, and they flung up their hands to protect their eyes from the cruel glare. Submarine! shouted the officer who held Santan in the crook of his arm. The swine has come to gloat on his butchery! The beam of light left them and swivelled away down the side of the hull. Come on, sunshine! He dragged her towards the ship's rail, but at that moment the tackle of the lifeboat gave way at the bows and spilled its frantic cargo screaming into the pounding waves far below. With yet another vast exhalation of air from her underwater wounds, the ship swung further outwards to an impossible angle, and Sontan and the officer slid irresistibly across the deck and hit the rail together. The merciless beam of white light moved from one end of the ship to the other, and when it passed over them it left them blinded and it seemed the night was even blacker and more menacing than before. The swines! The bloody swines! The officer's voice was rough and hoarse with rage. We must jump! Santan shouted back at him. We have to get off! When the first torpedo struck, Anna was seated at the dressing table in the cabin, she also had spent the afternoon working with the men on sea deck, and had left them only to help Santan prepare for dinner. She had expected Santan to be in the cabin waiting for her, and was mildly irritated when she was not. The child has no idea of time, she muttered, but laid out clean underwear for her charge before beginning her own toilet. The first explosion threw Anna off the stool, and she struck the back of her head on the corner of the bed. She lay there, stunned, while the successive blasts tore into the ship, and then darkness blinded her. She dragged herself onto her knees, with the alarm bells deafening her, and forced herself to begin the drill that they had practised almost daily since leaving Calais. Life jacket! 
She groped under the bed and pulled the clumsy apparatus over her head and began to crawl towards the door. Suddenly the lights went on again, and she dragged herself to her feet and leaned against the bulkhead and massaged the lump on the back of her head. Her senses cleared, and immediately she thought of Saint Tan. My baby! She started towards the door, and the ship lurched under her. She was thrown back against the dressing table, and at the same moment Saint Tan's jewel box slid across the table top, and would have fallen, but instinctively Anna caught it and held it to her chest. Abandon ship! a voice shrieked outside the cabin. The ship is sinking! Abandon ship! Anna had learned enough English to understand. Her practical, phlegmatic sense reasserted itself. The jewel box contained all their money and documents. She opened the locker over her head and pulled out the carpet bag and dropped the box into it. Then she looked around her swiftly. She swept the silver frame with the photographs of Santan, her mother, and Michael's squadron into the bag. Then she jerked open the drawer and stuffed warm clothing for Santan and herself on top of the jewel box and the picture frame. She fastened the bag as she glanced quickly about the cabin. That was all of value that they possessed. And she heaved open the door and stepped into the passageway beyond. Immediately she was picked up in the relentless stream of men, most of them still struggling with their life jackets. She tried to turn back. I must find Santen, I must find my baby. But she was borne out on to the deck and hustled towards one of the lifeboats. Two seamen grabbed her. Come on then, love, up's a daisy. And though she aimed a blow at the head of one of them with a the carpet bag, they boosted her over the side of the lifeboat, and she landed in a tangle of skirts and limbs between the thwarts. She dragged herself up, still clutching the carpet bag, and tried to climb out of the boat again. Catch hold of that silly bitch, somebody! A seaman shouted with exasperation, and rough hands seized her and pulled her down again. In minutes the lifeboat was so crowded that Anna was packed helplessly between bodies and could only rave and implore in Flemish and French and broken English. You must let me out. I have to find my little girl. Nobody took any notice of her, and her voice was drowned out by the shouting and scurrying, by the moaning of the wind and the crash of waves against the steel hull, and by the ship's own groans and squeals of dying roars. We can't take any more, a commanding voice shouted. Swing her out and let go. There was a gut-swooping drop down through the darkness, and the lifeboat struck the surface with such force that water was sprayed over them, and Anna was once more thrown to the half-flooded deck with a huddle of bodies on top of her. She dragged herself up again with the lifeboat tossing and leaping and thudding against the ship's sides. "'Get those oars out!' the voice again, harsh with authority. "'Fender off there, you men! That's right! All right, give way, starboard! Pull, damn you! Pull!' They dragged themselves away from the ship's side and got their bows into the sea before they were swamped. Anna crouched in the bottom of the boat, clutching a bag to her chest, and looked up at the tall hull that rose above them like a cliff. At that instant, a great white shaft of light sprang out of the darkness behind them and struck the ship. It played slowly across the glistening white hull like the spotlight of a theatre, picking out brief, tragic vignettes before passing on, groups of men trapped at the rail, a twisting figure in an untended stretcher sliding across the deck, a seaman caught in the tackle of a lifeboat and swinging like a figure on the gallows tree, and finally the beam rested for a few moments on the huge red crosses painted on the white hull. "'Yes, take a good look, you bloody swine!' One of the men near Anna in the lifeboat yelled, and immediately the cry was taken up. You murdering hun! You filthy butchers! All around Anna they were howling their anger and outrage. Implacably, the beam of searchlight travelled on, swinging down to the waterline of the hull. The surface of the sea was dotted with the heads of hundreds of swimmers. There were clusters of them, and individuals whose pale faces shone like mirrors in the intense white light, and still others were dropping and splashing into the water amongst them. 
while the sea surged and sucked them back and forth and threw them against the steel cliff of the hull. The searchlight lifted up to the high decks again, and they were canted at an improbable angle while the ship's bows were already thrusting below the surface and the stern was rising swiftly against the star-riddled sky. For an instant, the searchlight settled on a tiny group of figures pinned against the ship's rail, and Anna shrieked, Santen! The girl was in the middle of the group, her face turned towards the sea, looking down at the dark drop beneath her, the wild bush of her dark hair whipping in the wind. Santen! Anna screamed again, and with a lithe movement the girl had leaped to the top of the brass rail. She had lifted the heavy woolen skirts to her waist, and for an instant she balanced like an acrobat. Her bare legs were pale and slim and shapely, but she looked frail as a bird as she leaped away from the rail, and with her skirts ballooning wildly about her, fell out of the beam of light into the blackness beneath. Santan! Anna screamed one last time with despair in her voice, and ice in her heart. She tried to rise, the better to watch the fall of that small body, but somebody pulled her down again, and then the searchlight beam was extinguished, and Anna crouched in the lifeboat and listened to the cries of the drowning men. Pull, you men! We must get Claire, or she will suck us down with her when she goes! They had oars out on both sides of the lifeboat and were striking out raggedly, inching away from the stricken liner. There she goes! somebody yelled. Oh, God, will you look at that! The stern of the huge ship swung up, higher and still higher, into the night sky, and the rowers rested on their oars and stared up at her. When she reached the vertical, she hung for long seconds. They could see the silhouette of her propeller against the stars, and her lights were still burning in the rows of portholes. Slowly she began to slide downwards, bows first, her lights still shining beneath the water like drowning moons. Faster and still faster she slid downwards, and her plugets began to buckle and crackle with pressure. Air burst out of her in a seething, frothy turmoil, and then she was gone. Vast spoutings and eruptions of air and white foam still fountained up out of the black waters, but slowly these subsided, and once again they could hear the lonely cries of the swimmers. Pull back! We must pick up as many as we can! All the rest of that night they worked under the direction of the ship's first officer, who stood at the tiller in the stern of the lifeboat. They dragged the sodden, shivering wretches from the sea, packing them in until the lifeboat wallowed dangerously and took water over her gunwales at every swell, and they had to bail continuously. "'No more!' the officer shouted. "'You men will have to tie yourselves on to the lifelines!' The swimmers clustered around the overloaded vessel like drowning rats, and Anna was close enough to the stern to hear the first officer murmur, "'The poor devils won't last until morning. The cold will get them, even if the sharks don't.' They could hear other lifeboats around them in the night, the splash of oars, and voices on the wind. "'The current is running up into the north-northeast at four knots,' Anna overheard the first officer again. "'We will be scattered to the horizon by dawn. We must try and keep together.' He rose in the stern and hailed, "'Ahoy there! This is lifeboat sixteen. "'Lifeboat five! a faint voice hailed back. "'We will come to you!' They rowed through the darkness, guided by cries from the other boat, and when they found each other they lashed the two hulls together. During the night they called two other lifeboats to them. In the watery grey dawn they found another lifeboat half a mile away. The sea between them was strewn with wreckage and dotted with the heads of swimmers, but all of them were insignificant specks in the immense reaches of ocean and sky. In the boats they huddled together like cattle in the abattoir truck, already slumping into bovine lethargy and indifference, while those in the water bobbed and nodded as they hung in their life-jackets, 
a macabre dance of death. For already the icy green water that tumbled over their heads had sucked the body warmth for many of them. And they lolled, pale and lifeless. Sit down, woman! Anna's neighbours roused themselves as she tried to stand on the thwart. You'll have us all in the water, for God's sake! But Anna ignored their protests. Santan! she called. Is Santan anywhere? And when they stared at her uncomprehendingly, she searched for the nickname and remembered it. At last. Sunshine! she cried. It iman sunshine chesin! Has anybody seen sunshine? And there was a stir of interest and concern. Sunshine, is she with you? The query was passed swiftly about the cluster of tossing boats. I saw her on the deck just before the ship went down. She had a life jacket. She isn't here? No, she isn't here. I saw her jump, but I lost her after that. She isn't here, not in any of the boats. Anna sagged down again. Her baby was gone. She felt despair overwhelm and begin to suffocate her. She looked over the side of the lifeboat, the dead men hanging in their life jackets, and imagined Santan killed by the green waters, dead of the cold, and the infant in her womb dead also. And she groaned aloud. No, she whispered. God cannot be that cruel. I don't believe it. I'll never believe it. The denial gave her strength and the will to endure. There were other lifeboats. Santan is alive somewhere out there. She looked to the wind-smeared horizon. She's alive, and I will find her. If it takes me my whole life, I will find her again. The small incident of the search for the missing girl had broken the torpor of cold and shock that had gripped them all during the night, and now the leaders emerged to rally them to adjust the loading and the trim of the lifeboats, to count and take charge of the freshwater containers and the emergency rations, to see to the injured, to cut loose the dead men and finally let them float away, and to allocate duties to the rowers, and finally to set a course for the mainland a hundred miles and more out there in the east. With teams of rowers alternating at the long oars, they began to inch across the wild sea. Nearly every small gain wasted by the following wave that dashed into their bows and drove them back. That's it, lads, the first officer exhorted from stern. Keep it up! Any activity would stave off despondency, their ultimate enemy. Let's sing, shall we? Who'll give us a tune? What about Tipperary? Come along, then. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. But the wind and the sea grew stronger, and flung them about so that the oars would not bite, and one after the other the rowers gave up and slumped glumly, and the song died away, and they sat and waited. After a while the sense of waiting for something to happen passed, and they merely sat. Long after midday, the sun broke through the low, scudding cloud for a few minutes, and they lifted their faces to it, but then the cloud obscured it again, and the heads dropped like wild Namaqua daisies at sunset. Then from the lifeboat alongside where Anna sat, a voice spoke in a dull, almost disinterested tone. Look, isn't that a ship? For a while there was silence as though it took time to understand such an unlikely proposition. And then another voice, sharper and more alive. It is! It's a ship! Where? Where is it? A babble of excited voices now. There, just below that dark patch of cloud! Low down! Just the top! It's a ship! A ship! Men were trying to stand. Some of them had stripped off their jackets, and were waving frantically and shouting as though their lungs might burst. Anna blinked her eyes and stared in the direction they were all pointing. After a moment she saw a tiny triangular shape, darker grey against the dreary grey of the horizon. The first officer was busy in the stern, and abruptly there was a fierce whooshing sound, and a trail of smoke shot up 
into the sky and burst in a cluster of bright red stars as he fired one of the signal rockets from the stern locker. She's seen us! Look, look! She's altering course! It's a warship! Three funnels! Look at the tripod! Director Tar, she's one of the I class cruisers! By God! It's the inflexible! I saw her at Scapa Flow last year! God bless her, whoever she is! She's seen us, oh thank God! She's seen us! Anna found herself laughing and sobbing and clutching the carpet bag that was her only link with Son Ten. It will be all right now, my baby, she promised. Anna will find you now. You don't have to worry any more. Anna is coming to get you. And the deadly grey shape of the warship raced down upon them, shouldering and breaking the waters with her tall, axe-sharp bows. Anna stood at the rail of HMS Inflexible in a group of the survivors from the lifeboats and watched the immense flat-topped mountain rise out of the southern ocean. From this distance the proportions of the mountain were so perfect, the tableland at its summit so precisely cut and the steep slope so artfully fashioned, that it might have been sculptured by a divine Michelangelo. The men around her were excited and voluble, hanging on the rail and pointing out the familiar features of the land as their swift approach made each apparent. This was a homecoming of which most of them had many times despaired, and their relief and joy were pathetically childlike. Anna shared none of it with them. The sight of land induced in her only a corrosive impatience that she knew she could not long abide. The drive of the great ship under her was too puny, too snow-like for her anticipation. Every minute spent out here upon the ocean was wasted, for it delayed the moment when she could set out on the quests which had, in a few short days, become the central driving force of her existence. She fretted while the drama of sea and elements unfolded before her, while the wind which had crossed the wide sweep of the Atlantic free and unfettered met the sudden constraint of the great mountain and like a wild horse feeling the bit for the first time, reared and struggled in monstrous peak. Before Anna's eyes a dense white cloud blossomed upon the broad flat summit of the mountain, and began to boil over the sheer lip in a slow, gelatinous tide down the stark cliffs, and when the men around her exclaimed with wonder, she had only an insufferable desire to feel the land beneath her feet, and to turn those feet back into the north to begin the search. Now the angry wind racing down the cliffs came again to the sea, and ripped the placid sweet blue first to sombre gunmetal, and then to foam-flecked fury. As the inflexible came out of the lee of the mountain into the narrow roadway between Table Harbour and Robben Island, the south-easter struck her like a mallet, and even she was forced to make obeisance and heel to the power of the wind. In the days of sail, many great ships had come this close to the mountain only to be blown out again with rigging in disarray, not to sight land again for days or even weeks, but, inflexible, once she had acknowledged its force, drove in through the concrete breakwater, and surrendered only to the attentions of the fussy little steam tugs which bustled out to meet her. Like a lover, she kissed the wharf, and the crowd that lined it waved up at the decks, the women struggling with rebellious skirts, and the men clutching their hats to their heads, the strains of the marine band on the cruiser's foredeck rising and falling as the wind squalls gave rule Britannia an unusual cadence. As soon as the gangways were lowered, a group of figures hurried up them, harbour officials and naval officers in tropical whites and gold braid, together with a few obviously important civilians. Now, despite herself, Anna felt a slight prickle of interest as she studied the white buildings of the town that were scattered along the foot of the high grey cliffs. Africa, she murmured. So what was all the fuss about? I wonder what Santen... At the thought of the girl, all else was banished from her mind. Although she still stared towards the shore, she saw nothing and heard nothing 
until a light touch on her shoulder pulled her back to the present. One of the ship's midshipmen, callow as a schoolboy even in his smart tropical whites, saluted her diffidently. "'There is a visitor for you in the wardroom, ma'am.' When it was obvious that Anna did not understand, he beckoned her to follow him. At the door of the wardroom, the midshipman stood aside and ushered her through. Anna stood in the entrance and glowered around her suspiciously, holding the carpet bag protectively in front of her hips. Visitors and officers were already doing full justice to the ship's store of gin and tonic, but the cruiser's flag lieutenant saw Anna. Ah, here we are. This is the woman and he drew one of the civilians from the group of men and led him to meet Anna. Anna looked him over carefully. He was a slim, boyish figure, dressed in a dove-grey three-piece suit of expensive material and superior cut. Mefro Stock, he asked, almost diffidently, and with surprise Anna realised that, far from being a boy, he was probably twenty years or so her senior. Anna Stock? he repeated. His hair had receded in deep bays on each side of the smooth, scholarly forehead, but had been allowed to grow feathery wisps down his neck and on to his shoulders. We should take the scissors to you, she thought, and said, Yeah, I am Anna Stock, and he replied in Afrikaans that she understood readily. A pleasant meeting, Angenama Kennis. I am Colonel Garrick Courtney, but I am saddened, as you must be, by the terrible loss we have experienced. For a few moments, Anna did not understand what he was talking about. Instead, she studied him more closely, and now she saw that his unbarbered hair had sprinkled on the shoulder of his expensive suit with flakes of white dandruff. There was a button missing from his waistcoat, and the thread dangled loosely. There was a grease spot on his silk cravat, and the toe of one of his boots was scuffed. A bachelor, Anna decided. Despite his intelligent eyes and the sensitive, gentle mouth, there was something childlike and vulnerable about him, and Anna felt her maternal instincts stir. He stepped closer to her, and the clumsy movement reminded Anna of what General Courtney had told some tan, and her that Gary Courtney had lost one of his legs in a hunting accident when he was a boy. Coming on top of the death in action of my only son, Garrick lowered his voice, and the look in his eyes was enough to soften Anna's reserves. This new loss is almost too much to bear. I have not only lost my son, but my daughter and my grandson before even I had a chance to know them. Now at last Anna understood what he was talking about, and her face flushed with such fury that Garry recoiled instantly. "'Never say that again!' She followed him as he retreated, thrusting her face so close to his that their noses almost touched. "'Don't you dare ever to say that again!' "'Madam,' Garry faltered, "'I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Have I given you offence?' "'Santen is not dead.' And don't you ever dare again to speak as though she is. Do you understand? You mean Michael's wife is alive? Yes, Santan is alive. Of course she is alive. Where is she? Slow delight dawned in Gary's faded blue eyes. That is what we have got to find out, Anna told him firmly. We have got to find her again, you and I. Gary Courtney had a suite at the Mount Nelson Hotel, above the centre of Cape Town. There was, of course, no real alternative lodging for a gentleman traveller visiting the Cape of Good Hope. Its guest book read like a roll of honour. Statesmen and explorers, diamond magnates and big game hunters, gallant soldiers and illustrious peers of the realm, princes and admirals, had all made it their temporary home. The Courtney brothers, Gary and Sean, always had the same suite on the corner of the top floor, with a view on one side over the gardens, laid out by the governors of the Dutch East India Company, across the waters of Table Bay 
to the smoky blue mountains on the far side. On the other side, the grey rock ramparts of the mountain were so close that they blotted out half the sky. These legendary views did not distract Anna for a moment. She glanced quickly around the sitting room, then placed the carpet bag on the centre table and rummaged in it. She brought out the silver picture frame and showed it to Gary, who was hovering behind her indecisively. Good Lord, that's Michael. He took the frame from her and stared hungrily at the photograph of Number 21 Squadron, taken only a few months previously. It's so hard to believe. Gary broke off and gulped before going on. Could I please have a copy of this made for myself? Anna nodded, and Gary transferred his attention to the two photographs in the second leaf. This is Sontaine. He pronounced it in the English way. Her mother, Anna touched the other. This is Sontaine. She corrected his pronunciation. They are so much alike. Gary turned the photographs to catch the light. Yet the mother is prettier, but the daughter, Sontaine, has more force of character. Anna nodded again. Now you know why she cannot be dead. She does not give up easily. Her manner became brusque, but we are wasting time. We need a map. The hotel porter knocked on the door within minutes of Gary's call, and they spread the chart he brought between them. I do not uh, understand these things, Anna told him. Show me where the ship was torpedoed. Gary had the position from the Inflexibles, navigating officer, and he marked it for her. Do you see? Anna was triumphant. It is only a few centimetres from the land. She stroked the outline of Africa with her finger. So close, so very close. It's a hundred miles, even further, perhaps. Are you always so miserable? Anna snapped. They told me that the tide runs towards the land, and the wind also was blowing so strongly towards the land. Anyway, I know my little girl. The current runs at four knots, and the wind... Gary made a quick calculation. It's possible, but it would have taken days. Already, Gary was enjoying himself. He liked this woman's absolute assurance. All his life he had been a victim of his own doubts and indecision. He could not remember even once being as certain of a single thing as she seemed certain of everything. So with the wind and water pushing her, where has she come ashore? Anna demanded. Show me. Gary penciled in his estimates. I would say about here. Ah! Anna placed a thick, powerful finger on the map and smiled. When she smiled, she looked less like Chaka. Gary's huge, fierce mastiff, and Gary grinned with her. Ah, so, do you know this place? Well, I know a bit about it. I went with Burta and Smuts in 1914 as a special correspondent for the Times. We landed here at Walthus Bay, the Bay of Wales. Good, good, Anna cut him short. So there is no problem. We will go there and find Santen, yes? When can we leave? Tomorrow? It isn't quite that easy. Gary was taken aback. You see, that is one of the fiercest deserts in the world. Anna's smile disappeared. Always you find problems, she told him ominously. Always you want to talk instead of doing things. And while you talk, what is happening to Santin, eh? We must go quickly. Gary stared at her in awe. Already she seemed to know him intimately. She had recognized that he was a dreamer and a romantic, content to live in his imagination, to live through the characters of his writings, rather than in the real harsh world which frightened him so. Now there is no more time for your talking. There are things to be done. First we will make a list of these things, and then we will do them. Now begin. What is the first thing? Nobody had ever spoken to Gary like this, not at least since his childhood. With his military rank and his Victoria Cross, with his inherited wealth, his scholarly works of history, and his reputation as a philosopher, the world treated him with the respect accorded to a sage. He knew he did not truly merit any of these considerations, so they terrified and confused Gary. 
and his defence was to withdraw further into his imaginary world. While you make the list, take off your waistcoat. Madam? Gary looked shocked. I am not madam, I am Anna. Now give me your waistcoat. There is a button missing. He obeyed quietly. The first thing Gary, in his shirt leaves, wrote on a sheet of hotel notepaper, is to cable the military governor in Vintook. We will need permits. This is all a closed military area. We will need his cooperation. He will be able to arrange provisions and water points. Now that Gary had been prodded into taking action, he was working quickly. Anna sat opposite him, stitching on the button with those strong, capable fingers. What provisions? You will need the second list for those. Of course. Gary pulled another sheet towards him. There! Anna bit off the thread and handed him back his waistcoat. You can put it on now. Yes, my fro, said Gary meekly. But he could not remember when last he had felt so good. It was after midnight when Gary went out onto the small balcony of his bedroom in his dressing gown to take a last breath of night air and while he reviewed the events of the day, the buoyant feeling of well-being remained with him. Between them, he and Anna had performed prodigies of labour. They already had a reply from the military governor in Windhoek. As always, the Courtney name had opened the door to wholehearted cooperation. Their reservations had been made on the passenger train that would leave tomorrow afternoon and take them over the Orange River and across the wastes of Namaqualand and Bushmanland, four days' travel to Windhoek. They had even completed the major part of outfitting the expedition. Gary had spoken on the telephone, an instrument which he usually viewed with grave misgivings, to the owner of Stutterford's general dealer stores. The stores he required would be packed in wooden cases, the contents of each clearly labelled on it, and delivered to the railway station the following afternoon. Mr. Stutterford had given Gary his personal assurance that it would all be ready in time and had sent one of the green motor vans up to the Mount Nelson Hotel with a selection of safari clothing for both Gary and Anna. Anna had rejected most of Mr. Stutterford's offerings as being either too expensive or too frivolous. I am not the poule, and she chose long, thick calico skirts and heavy lace-up boots with hobnailed soles, flannel underwear, and only at Gary's insistence, the African sun is a killer, a cork, solar, topi, with a green neck flap. Gary had also arranged a transfer of £3,000 to the Standard Bank in Windhoek to cover the expedition's final outfitting. It had all been done swiftly, decisively, and efficiently. Gary took a long draw on his cigar and flicked the butt over the edge of the balcony then turned back into his bedroom. He dropped his dressing gown over the chair and climbed in between white sheets as crisp as lettuce leaves and switched out the bedside light. Instantly all his old misgivings and self-doubts came crowding out of the darkness. It's madness, he whispered, and in his mind's eye saw again those terrible deserts shimmering endlessly in the blinding heat a thousand miles of coastline, swept by a cruel current so cold that even a strong man could survive in those waters for only a few hours before hypothermia sucked the life out of him. They were setting out to look for a young girl of delicate breeding, a pregnant girl, who had last been seen plunging from the high deck of a stricken liner into the icy dark sea a hundred miles from this savage coast. What were their chances of finding her? He flinched from even trying to estimate them. Madness, he repeated miserably, and suddenly he wished that Anna was there to bolster him. He was still trying to find an excuse to summon her from a single bedroom at the end of the corridor when he fell asleep. Santan knew but she was drowning. She had been sucked so deeply beneath the surface that her lungs were crushing under the weight of the dark waters. Her head was full of the monstrous roaring of the sinking ship and of the crackle and squeal of the pressure in her own eardrums.
she knew she was doomed. But she fought with all her strength and determination, kicking and clawing for life against the cold leaden drag of waters, fighting against the burning agony of her lungs and the need to breathe. But the turbulence swirled her into vertigo, so that she lost any sense of upward and downward movement, but still she fought on, and she knew that she would die fighting for her baby's life. Then suddenly she felt the cracking weight of water on her ribs, releasing, felt her lungs swelling in her chest, and an updraft of air and bubbles from the ruptured hull pulled her up like a spark from a campfire and hurled her towards the surface, with a pressure pain burning in her eardrums and the drag of the life jacket cutting into her armpits. She broke through the surface and was thrown high on the seething fountain of escaping air. She tried to breathe but took water into her straining lungs and coughed and wheezed in agonised paroxysms until she cleared her air passages. And then it was almost as though the sweet sea air was too strong and rich for her. It burned like fire and she gasped and laboured like an asthmatic. Slowly she managed to control her breathing, but the waves came at her unexpectedly, out of the darkness, breaking over her head, smothering her again, so that she had to train herself to regulate each breath to the rhythm of the ocean. Between the breaking swells, she tried to assess her own condition, and found herself undamaged. No bones seemed broken or cracked, despite that terrible gut-swooping drop from the ship's rail and the stunning impact on water as hard as a cobbled street. She still had full control of her limbs and her senses, but then she felt the first stealthy invasion of the cold through her clothing, into her body and her blood. I've got to get out of the water, she realised. One of the lifeboats. Now for the first time she listened for sounds, and at first there was only the wind and the rushing break of the white caps. Then she heard... Faintly, very faintly, a gabble of human voices, a magpie chorus of croaks and cries, and she opened her mouth and called for help, but a wave broke in her face, and she took more water and gasped and choked. It took her minutes to recover, but as soon as her lungs were clear, she struck out grimly towards where she thought the voices were, no longer wasting strength on vainly beseeching the aid of others. The heavy life-jacket dragged, and the crests broke over her. She was lifted on the swells and dropped into the troughs, but she kept swimming. "'I have to get out of the water,' she kept telling herself. "'The cold is the killer. I have to reach one of the boats.' She reached out for the next stroke and hit something solid, the force that broke the skin of her knuckles, but instantly she grasped for it. It was something large that floated higher, than her head, but she could find no secure handholds upon it, and in panic realised that she already was too far gone to drag herself up by main strength. She began to grope her way around the piece of floating wreckage, searching for a handhold. Not big. In the darkness, she judged it to be not more than twelve feet long and half as broad, made of timber but coated with smooth oil paint, one edge of it torn and splintered, so that she scratched her hand on it. She felt the sting of the tearing skin, but the cold numbed the pain. One end of the wreckage floated high, the other end dipped below the surface, and she pulled herself onto it, belly down. Immediately she felt how precariously balanced the structure was, Although she had only dragged her upper body onto it, and her legs from the waist down were still hanging in the water, the wreckage tipped dangerously towards her, and there was a hoarse cry of protest. "'Be careful, you bloody fool! You'll have us over!' Somebody else had found a raft before her. "'I'm sorry,' she gasped. "'I didn't realise. "'All right, lad, just be careful!' The man on the raft had mistaken a voice for that of one of the ship's boys. "'Here, give me a hand!' Santan groped frantically and touched outstretched fingers. She seized the offered hand. Easy does it! She kicked as the man pulled her up the sloping angle of slippery painted wreckage, and then with her free hand she found a hold. 
She lay belly down on the tossing, unstable deck, and felt suddenly too weak and trembling to lift her head. She was out of the deadly water. "'Are you all right, son?' Her rescuer was lying beside her, his head close to hers. "'I'm all right, too. She felt the touch of his hand on her back. "'You've got a life jacket. Good boy. Use the tapes to tie yourself to this strut. Here, let me show you.' He lashed Santan to the strut in front of her. "'I've tied a slippery knot. If we capsize, just pull this end, savvy?' "'Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. "'Save it for later, lad.' The man beside her lowered his head onto his arms, and they lay shivering and sodden and rode the headlong rush of waves out of the night on their frail, unstable vessel. Without speaking again, without even being able to see more than each other's vague shapes in the darkness, they quickly learned to balance the raft between them with coordinated, subtle movements of their bodies. The wind increased in viciousness, but although the sea rose with it, they managed to keep the higher side of the raft headed into it, and only an occasional burst of spray splattered over them. After a while, Santan lapsed into an exhausted sleep, so deep that it was almost comatose. She awoke in daylight, a muted grey and dreary light in a world of wild grey waters and low, sagging grey clouds. Her companion on the raft was squatting on the canted, insecure deck beside her, and he was watching her steadfastly. "'Miss Sunshine,' he said, as soon as she stirred and opened her eyes. "'Never guess it was you when you came aboard last night.' She sat up quickly, and the tiny raft dipped and rocked dangerously under them. "'Steady on, love. That's the ticket.' He put out a gnarled hand to restrain her. There was a tattoo of a mermaid on his forearm. "'My name's Ernie, miss. Leading seaman Ernie Simpson, of course. I knew you right away. Everybody on board knows Miss Sunshine.' He was skinny and old, thin grey hair plastered with salt to his forehead, and his face wrinkled as a prune. But though his teeth were yellow and crooked, his smile was kindly. "'What has happened to the others, Ernie?' Frantically, Santan looked around her, the true horror of their situation— coming over her again. Gone to Davy Jones, most of them. Davy Jones? Who is he? Drowned, I mean. Rot the bloody hun who did it. The night had hidden the true extremity of their situation from Son Ten. The reality that was revealed now was infinitely more frightening than her imaginings. As they dropped into the swells, they were dwarfed by the cold, opaque canyons of the sea, and as they rode up and over the crests, the vista of loneliness was such as to force Santan to cringe down on the tiny deck. There was nothing but the water and the sky, no lifeboat nor swimmer, not even a seabird. We are all alone, she whispered. Tussle. Cheer up, love. We're all still kicking. That's what counts. Ernie had been busy while she still slept. She saw that he had managed to glean a few fragments of debris and floating wreckage from the sea around them. There was a sheet of heavy-gauge canvas dragging behind the raft. Around its edge, short lengths of hemp rope had been spliced into eye-holes. It floated like some monstrous octopus with limp tentacles. Lifeboat cover. Ernie saw her interest. And those are ship's spars and some other odds and ends. Begging your pardon, miss. Never know what will come in useful. He had lashed this collection of wreckage together with the lengths of rope from the lifeboat cover. And even while he explained to Santan, he was working with scarred but nimble fingers splicing short pieces of rope into a single length. I'm thirsty, Santan whispered. The salt had scalded her mouth, and her lips felt hot and bloated. Think about something else, Ernie advised. Here, give us a hand with this. Can you splice? Santan shook her head. Ernie dropped all his H's, and as a Frenchwoman she sympathised with him and found it easy to like him. It's easy. Come on, love. I'll learn you how. Watch. 
Ernie had a clasp knife attached by a lanyard to his belt, and he used the spike on the back of it to open the weave of the hemp. One over one, like a snake into its hole. See? Quickly, Santan got the hang of it. The work helped to take her mind off their awful predicament. Do you know where we are, Ernie? I'm no navigator, Miss Sunshine, but we are west of the coast of Africa. How far off, I haven't a clue, but somewhere out there is Africa. Yesterday, at noon said we were 110 miles offshore. I'm sure you're right, Ernie nodded. All I know is we've got the current helping us, and the wind also. He turned his face up to the sky. If only we can use the wind. Have you got the plan, Ernie? Always got a plan, miss. Not always a good one, I admit. He grinned at her. Just get this rope finished first. As soon as they had a single length of rope, twenty feet long, Ernie handed her the clasp knife. Tie it around your middle, love. That's the ticket. We don't want to drop it, do we? He slid over the side of the raft and paddled like a dog to the dragging wreckage. With some tan heaving and shoving under his direction, they worked two of the salvaged spars into position and lashed them securely with a hemp rope. Outriggers, Ernie spluttered with seawater. A trick I learned from the darkies in Hawaii. The raft was dramatically stabilised, and Ernie crawled back on board. Now we can think about putting up some kind of a sail. It took four abortive attempts before the two of them were able to rig a jury mast and hoist a sail hacked from the canvas of the boat cover. We aren't going to win the America's Cup, love, but we are moving. Look at the wake, Miss Sunshine. They were spreading a sluggish, oily wake behind their cumbersome craft, and Ernie trimmed their tiny sail carefully. Two knots at least, he estimated. Well done, Miss Sunshine. You're a game one, and no mistake. Couldn't have done that all alone. He was perched on the stern of the raft, steering with a salvaged length of timber as a tiller. Now you settle down and take a rest, love. You and I will have to stand watches back to back. All the rest of that day the wind came at them in gusts and squalls, and twice their clumsy mast was thrown overboard. Each time Ernie had to go into the water to retrieve it, and the effort required to lift the heavy spar and the wet canvas, then to re-step and lash it back in place, left Santan trembling and exhausted. At nightfall the wind moderated and held steady and gentle out of the southwest. The clouds broke up so they had glimpses of the stars. I'm tuckered out. You'll have to take a turn at the tiller, Miss Sunshine. Ernie showed her how to steer, and the raft responded sullenly to the push of the tiller. That red star there, that's Antares, with a small white star on each side of him. Just like a sailor on shore leave with a girlfriend on each arm, begging your pardon, Miss Sunshine, but you just keep heading towards Antares, and we'll be all right. The old seaman curled up at her feet like a friendly dog, and Santan crouched on the stern of the raft, and held the crew tiller under one arm. The swells dropped with the wind, and it seemed to her that their passage through the water was faster. Looking back, she could see the green phosphorescence of their wake spreading out behind them. She watched the red giant Antares with his two consorts climb up the black velvet curtain of the sky. Because she was lonely and still afraid, she thought of Anna. My darling Anna, where are you? Are you still alive? Did you reach one of the lifeboats, or are you two clinging to some scrap of wreckage, waiting on the judgment of the sea? Her longing for the solid, bulky assurance of her old nurse was so intense that it threatened to turn her into a child once more, and she felt the childlike tears scalding her eyelids, and Antare's glaring red light blurred and multiplied before her. She wanted to crawl into Anna's lap, and bury her face in the warm, soapy smell of her vast bosom, and she felt all the resolve and purpose of the day's struggle melt in her, and she thought how easy it would be to lie down beside Ernie and not have to try any more. She sobbed aloud. 
The sound of her own sob startled her, and suddenly she was angry with herself and her own weakness. She wiped the tears away with her thumbs and felt the gritty crunch of dried salt crystals on her eyelashes. Her anger grew stronger, and deliberately she turned it away from herself to the fates which so afflicted her. Why? she demanded of the great red star. What have I ever done that you single me out? Are you punishing me? Michel and my father, Noir and Anna, everything I have ever loved, why do you do this to me? She broke off the thought, appalled at how close she had come to blasphemy. She hunched over, placed her free hand on her own belly, and shivered with the cold. She tried to feel some sign of the life in her body, some swelling, some lump, some movement, but she was disappointed, and her anger returned full strength, and with it a kind of wild defiance. I make a vow. As mercilessly as I have been afflicted, so hard will I fight to survive. You, whether you are God or devil, have thrust this upon me. So I give my oath. I will endure, and my son will endure through me. She was raving. She realized it, but did not care. She had risen to her knees and was shaking her fist at the red star in defiance and anger. Come, she challenged. Do your worst, and let's have done. If she had expected a blast of thunder and a lightning bolt, there was none. Only the sound of the wind in the rude mast, and the scrap of sail, and the bubble of the wake under the stern of the raft. Santan sagged back onto her haunches, and grabbed the tiller, and grimly pointed the raft up into the east. In the first light of the day, a bird came and hovered above Santan's head. It was a small seabird, the dark blue-gray of a rifle barrel, with soft white chalky marks over its beady black eyes, and its wings were beautifully shaped and delicate, and its cry was lonely and soft. "'Wake up, Ernie!' Santan cried, and her swollen lips split at the effort, and a bubble of blood ran down her chin. The inside of her mouth was furry and dry as an old rabbit skin, and her thirst was a bright, burning thing. Ernie struggled up and looked about him dazedly. He seemed to have shrunk and withered during the night, and his lips were flaky and white and encrusted with salt crystals. "'Look, Ernie, a bird!' Santan mumbled through her bleeding lips. "'A bird!' Ernie echoed, staring up at it. "'Land close!' The bird turned and darted away, low over the water, and was lost to sight, steel-grey, against the dark grey sea. In the middle of the morning, Santem pointed ahead, her mouth and her lips so desiccated that she could not speak. There was a dark, tangled object floating on the surface just ahead of the raft. It wallowed and waved its tentacles like a monster from the depths. "'Sea kelp!' Ernie whispered. And when they were close enough, he gaffed it with a tiller arm and drew the heavy mat of vegetation alongside the raft. The stalk of the kelp was as thick as a man's arm and five metres long, with a bushy head of leaves at its end. It had obviously been torn from the rocks by the storm. Moaning softly with thirst, Ernie cut a length of the thick stalk. Under the rubbery skin there was a pulpy section of stem and a hollow air chamber within. Ernie shaved the pulp with a clasp knife and thrust a handful of the shavings into Santan's mouth. It was running with sap. The taste was strong and unpleasant, iodine and peppery, but Santan let the liquid trickle down her throat and whispered with delight. They gorged themselves in the juice of the kelp and spat out the pith. Then they rested a while and felt the strength flowing back into their bodies. Ernie took the tiller again and headed the raft down the path of the wind. The storm clouds had blown away and the sun warmed them and dried their clothing. At first they held their faces up to its caress, but soon it became oppressive and they tried to huddle away from it in the tiny patch of the shade from the sail. 
When the sun reached its zenith, they were exposed to the scourge of its full strength, and it sucked the moisture from their bodies. They squeezed a little more of the kelp juice, but now the unpleasant chemical taste nauseated Santen, and she realized that if she vomited, she would lose so much of her precious fluids. They could drink the kelp juice only sparingly. With her back against the jury mast, Sun Tan stared out at the horizon. The great ring of threatening water that surrounded them, unbroken except in the east, where a line of sombre cloud lay low on the sea. It took her almost an hour to realise that despite the wind, the cloud had not changed shape. If anything, it had firmed and grown a hairline taller along the horizon. She could make out tiny irregularities, low peaks and valleys that did not alter shape as ordinary clouds would. Ernie, she whispered, Ernie, look at those clouds. The old man blinked his eyes and then rose slowly into a crouch. He started to make a soft moaning sound in his throat and Santen realised it was a sound of joy. She rose beside him and for the first time looked upon the continent of Africa.